So as we're doing the last bit of shuffle up here, let me remind you that we do record um, tab meetings and they are posted on the website. So um, that's, I just don't wanna get crosswise with Washington state law. Quorum check. We're good, okay. Thumbs up on the quorum. Uh, if you want to speak, remember to put your name tent sideways. If you are online, please let us know in chat. If you have signed in in the room, thank you. If you haven't signed in in the room, Olivia would love to see your smile and collect your autograph. Here and spell your name right in the minutes. And with that, oh, okay. Um, Mike, would you please do this the honors? Yes. Hey, good morning and welcome to day two of the January 2023 Hanford Advisory Board meeting. Again, my name is Mike Birkenbile. I am the designated de deputy federal officer for the Hanford site. As a reminder, this meeting will be conducted in accordance with the Federal Advisory Committee Act. Advisory committees have played an important role in shaping programs and policies of the federal government. The Hanford Advisory Board Board's role is to provide policy level advice and recommendations concerning EM site specific issues such as cleanup activities and environmental restoration, waste and nuclear materials management and disposition, excess facilities, future land use and long term stewardship, risk management and communications and outreach. I do appreciate your attendance today. I look forward to the Hanford Advisory Board's submission of constructive actionable policy level advice on the Hanford cleanup. Thank you. Um, we are open. I do have a clarification from yesterday and I'm going to go slightly out of order for the agenda only because I'm losing battery power on that message, uh, the peril of technology. So if I can actually access the message, that would be helpful. Thank you. So uh, last night there was a question regarding about when DOE anticipates achieving high level tank waste treatment. Um, when Brian Vance responded, he actually responded um, with um, uh, low activity waste law. And um, so the clarification is that um, uh, DOE has provided a notice of serious risk to the HLW and pretreatment milestones. Additionally, DOE continues to be engaged in holistic negotiations regarding the tank waste treatment mission. Um, I'm not an authority on HLW or nor technical point of contact, so I would ask that if you do have questions about that, um, that you would route those through the HAB chair and um, we'll, we'll get you answers to that. Thank you. All right. Do you want to go over the meeting ground rules as well, Mike? I do. Thank you for that. I'm looking, I'm looking at the list. Reading right off the list here. Everybody's got them. You can follow along. Uh, listen carefully on our guidance of the chair and facilitator. Be respectful and assume all participants have good intentions. Minimize sidebar conversations in the room and in chat. Mute yourself online or leave the room if you must answer a phone call. With that um, recommendation to check your cell phone, set them to stun, vibrate. Um, I was a victim of that yesterday, so lesson learned there. Thank you. All right. So bud. Uh, today is the day for you all to do a lot of sharing of perspectives and examples um, from from where you come from and the people that you represent at this table. So the three big chunks of work, um, we're gonna continue a discussion on the HAB operations work group and its recommendations about working towards finding ways to make the committees work better. Um, I know we only had a half an hour yesterday, so we built in some time this morning for you for those questions that popped up overnight about what comes next. Then we wanna talk about connecting with your constituencies. Um, one of the priorities this year has been to improve outreach. Um, and the starting point is to bring a little bit of what the Public Involvement Committee traditionally does um, into the broader board. So we're gonna ask you about examples of what you do with the people you represent to share information from this group to them 
as well as to bring their perspectives into the discussions of this group. Um, so this is an active meeting. And then um, before we do board business, we're going to get an update from the TPA agencies on the next membership package and how that's going. What questions do you have about today's work? I see cards up. Are those questions about today's work? A general question? Sure. Rose and then Alfonso. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could at least tell us who's online. I have no idea who's participating online. And so could you run down names? So run down just, the names? Yeah, just so we know who's participating online. We did that yesterday as way of introduction for the EPA uh, regional director, but just I'd like to know who's online. Right. <laughs> so there, are, I've got 20, 21 people listed online. Some of us are both in the room and online. So there are a couple that are double counted. Um, so uh, I'm double counted. Uh, Roberto Armijo from EPA. Uh, that if you look at the the right hand side here, that's that's actually who's online. I know it's probably really hard to read from where you are. Um, Patrick Conrad, Dan Solitz, Colleen Drinkard, Esteban Ortiz, um, our sound guy, Dave, um, Hendrickson, um, Matt, Edward Holbrook, Josh, who's on our staff in the back of the room, um, Kermit Mankiller, Lacey, who's up here with me, Laura Feldman, Ryan Miller, Olivia, who's at our sign-in table, Simone, I believe is from Columbia Riverkeeper, Sue Coleman, Todd Myers, Tom Cecilia, and Deb Jurgen, who's supporting us in the room as well, and Gary Younger. So a little bit of overlap with people in the room, but Right. And it, it it hovers for board meetings between 20 and 40 people online. Um, kind of depends on the topic. You're welcome. Alfonso. Yeah, my uh, question was or comment was for Mr. Brickenbeil on the uh, questions being asked or answered. Uh, away from this meeting, can you make sure that we get an email follow up on what the question was and what the answers were? So we also are included if we don't ask a question. Does that make sense? Um, I'm not quite clear. I guess if somebody asked from the, from the committee here, ask a question, I would like to know what the question was and what the answer was. So we're also informed of beyond beyond what is recorded in our in our session no Alfonso, you mentioned or separately yes. yeah, oh i understand let me try it um if there's a question associated with the opening topic i had for clarification correct that you're provided a copy and the answer of that yes sir. correct can do all right I yes sir rob yeah um mike yesterday i was asked by new member here what the holistic negotiations is, what is it? And, you know, I was really struggling to understand that. Um, could you describe um, just the basics of who the participants are and maybe some of the subjects that they're trying and, and what, their, what their goal is in the end to accomplish? I mean, what is a holistic negotiation? Please. Gary, Gary, are you able to speak to that at all? I'm not. Ryan is online. Ryan, Ryan is online, and he he often knows the letter. Hang on, keep going. Yeah, I'll put the link in the chat. But there was a. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Yeah, thank okay. you, Ryan. Keep going. Yeah, I'll put a link in the chat. Our former director, Maya Bellin, sent a letter to DOE back in 2019. After uh, I believe um, DOE had sent Ecology a letter that they wouldn't be able to meet. Um, certain milestones, and I, I believe that was regarding uh, the tank waste mission. So they entered holistic negotiations with 
uh, or comprehensive negotiations, I guess they call their quote, but I'll, I'll link I'll link to the to the letter so you guys get a better understanding. But so back in 2019, 2020, the agencies, including EPA, entered into uh, the the negotiations together under a mediation confidentiality confidentiality mediation agreement with um, uh, with the mediator, and so they've been discussing that that kind of path forward for for that mission ever since. And I will I will link to appropriate documents and that can give you guys some better context than the very quick version I'm giving you. Right. Tom Galliotto. Oh, thanks, Ruth. This is a quick comment to Mike's comment about the uh, response from yesterday. Uh, the question again was, uh, has DOE concluded that we're in jeopardy of not making the 2033, I guess, uh, start for the high, high level waste startup? Um, I appreciate you following up with that. The, the follow on question, which we didn't answer because of the response we got, or that we didn't ask, was really geared to the HAB because it was associated with the analysis of alternatives report that just came out in the last week or so. And that, that report summarized uh, various options for treatment of way, uh, low level, sorry, high level ways. Um, and it, at the end of this summary of that report, it indicated that we could uh, respond with questions or concerns to, to, um, to a DOE representative. My question to have in that regard, do we have any active effort to respond to that direct report, the analysis of alternatives? Because it's key to tank waste, it's key to follow up on um, the difference between low level and high level waste and how we're treating them and the, and the radioactive uh, reclassification issues, they're all tied together. And these issues that I identified, uh, the report identified in this report, we have a chance to respond to those, and it seems to me we should be doing that. So I, I guess I'd look to Rob or Susan to to see if we should get an effort together to provide some level of response to the OE. Thank you. Now, Rob and I are looking at each other. <laughs> um, tanks meeting is in, in a couple of weeks. Rob, do you want to include that on the agenda? Yeah, well, we should certainly discuss it as well as the um, um, the um, uh, academy's report that came out last two weeks ago. So we'll be talking about both those. Um, I, I know you and I've talked about this, Tom, already, and I, I certainly see that it's appropriate um, that we ask DOE um, if our handlers, if you would be okay if we start an IM team on the AOA? And that'll have to, you guys got to have to think about it because we can't just do it on our own. We kind of need some cooperation in that. We can't independently take up a subject um, that we're not assigned. And maybe the EIC will also have to play a role in this. All right. So you're thinking about tanks committee chartering an IM team for the AOA? If I, I think it could come under the tanks, okay. unless you wanted to maybe make it the first one for this executive group that we had on our, our change. I mean, I, we, I don't feel um, that we have to do it. I, I just think it's an important enough and they are asking for comments. Um, and I think that we are, represent the biggest interest here that it may be appropriate that we consider this. I, I, it's got to come from the EIC, right? The EIC is basically assigns the IMs. So we'll bring it up, but I think it's a good idea. I think that we should offer comments on it. Let me be a process nerd for a minute. The Tank Waste Committee has the ability to create an IM team. You, you don't need the EIC's blessing for a committee to create an IM team. You'd need the EIC's agreement if the IM team was gonna be chartered under the EIC, but 
if the tanks committee says we want to look at the alternatives analysis and consider if we want to recommend the board say something about it, the, the committee can can have that discussion. Would we get support from DOE? I can't speak for DOE. I know that's what I mean, Gary. Would we? Uh, you know, certainly there are people in your organization that are well studied and versed in the AOA and what's going on, and you know, a commitment from DOE to give us a presentation on it and their understanding and. I mean, we want to give whatever we give, if we give anything, we want to give it with authority and with a deep understanding. It's important. So. Mm -hmm. Rob, I appreciate the question. Uh, and uh, if, if you've got some specific questions that you want answered, if you could forward those to see what we can do to support that. Otherwise, it would be the committee talking about the report and uh, and I would make my schedule available to support that under FACA guidelines. Uh, so we'll do what we can to help you out on that. All right, all right. I'd, I'd like to add to that. So, so I understand that um, there are likely questions forthcoming as a result of the clarification. Um, um, Tom had articulated that also that um, you needed to confer collectively. I think whatever comes out of that in process space would be appropriate. Then, then uh, Gary's comments certainly are, are um, uh, value added with respect right, to, right. to what what happens next. Yeah, brother. I, I don't want to postulate all the way out into the future, but but I think you have a process, and we support the process. I, I don't think I know you do, and we support the process. Right. right. We needed to get back on track. Max, you get the last question. I apologize. Thanks, Rob. Um, just as a time consideration, um, I believe the analysis of alternatives timeline for comment is 90 days from when it was released, which was this week. So whatever the board wants to do specifically on a comment on the AOA, they have to consider that timeline, which is, you know, 90 days is enough time for an organization to come together, I would think, and put comments together, but I know that there's processes involved in how it works, so just to consider that. Thank you for that. All right. So let's move on. We've got about 25 minutes to talk about yesterday's information from the operations work group. Um, Chris Sutton and Tom Cecilia gave you an overview of the work group, who's on it, um, what the work group has been working on in terms of making committees work better. Um, there are copies of that presentation in the back because I know a number of you wanted to, to be able to see some of the literally small print, um, as well as information on some of the documents work that that group is doing. Um, because we were time limited yesterday, we wanted to make sure there was a little more time today um, for any ideas, questions you might have um, after sleeping on it overnight. Rose, and then Michelle. Yeah, I, being fairly new to this group, do have a question with this regards to this because um, prior to my packet being approved, um, and going through, I was assigned to participate in some of the committee meetings just to kind of keep track of what mm -hmm. was going on. And during that period of time, I was not allowed to speak, you know, during those meetings because I was not yet a member of the HABs. And so my question is, is if we have others who are um, participating in some of these meetings um, within our group who have, you know, specialized knowledge that would apply to a particular topic um, and they participate in this, are they not going to be allowed then to, to comment or to have any exchange within the committee groups or the subgroups? I was, I'm gonna say this, originally I was told that on the committee level, if you're participating at the committee, not at the board meeting, but at the committee level, that as a participant um, in that committee, that you would still be able to, you know, speak and, and have exchange of ideas and that type of thing. So I just really am looking for clarification 
on how that's going to work because we likely will have folks attending some of these meetings that are not officially on the board. Yeah. I think the interesting thing with the have right now, well, one of many interesting things is before COVID, there were ways things were done. I'll call it that way because um, I don't want to get into a requirements guidance debate. Um, and the the COVID experience and the increased use of hot online and hybrid meetings has really caused a lot of us to think about, wait a minute, we did it this in the past, does it still work for us going forward? Um, and, and DOE um, also has, we are working to better be in alignment with FACA requirements. Um, you've heard that that DOE needs a presence at IM team meetings, which is, is a FACA compliance thing. So I think the operations work group, and, and they need to speak for themselves, is looking at how do we want those things to work and run? Um, and so I understand your confusion because we're trying to figure it out. Well, so, thing, Tom, yeah. can you help me out here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely we need to get some kind of because we're going to have our subject matter experts trying to attend, but they have to be able to engage and participate. Otherwise, it's it's little value to us. You know, I mean, anyway, so right. so I can I can sort of talk to what we've been talking uh, at the work group. Um, and I think there's general agreement that um, everyone is invited to all the committee meetings and um, can speak, uh, you know, in in the appropriate queue. What would be restricted to committee members is actually uh, being considered for consensus or voting for committee leadership. Um, but everything else would be um, open to whoever wants to be engaged um, at at the sort of discretion of the chair and facilitation contract to contractor to make sure that we stay on agenda, but other than that, um, it would be open. Ryan, you were on this topic as well. Yeah, I kind of echo what Tom said, but DOE, DOE has said in the last year, and I'm sure Gary Mike could could expand or or uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that anyone is welcome to participate in committee meetings, just that if they're not have members, they just can't you know vote or do any of those kind of have member kind of action items. And I'm going to weigh in here for as chair. You, you got to that. I'm going to weigh in as chair. My reading of the operating ground rules and the EMSSAB charter welcomes public members to the table. So, as Tom says, you can't hold a leadership position and you can't vote or do consensus, but we're welcoming non board members members of the public to engage and in fact just recently last week we did that with the grout imt meeting we had several former members and non-members and new soon to be members um, because of their technical ex expertise and their experience with the topic in the room figuratively it was a hybrid meeting so yes we're we're kind of we're in an evolution time right now um, so patience, but we're moving forward. Oh, I've got Michelle and Dan Solitz. Michelle. Okay, I have two quick clarifying questions and one actual question. Clarifying question number one, I am is? Issue manager. Thank you. Issue manager team. I just didn't remember. Okay. Second question. What is the difference between these quarterly board meetings and the committee of the whole? What would differentiate between something that got discussed at this meeting versus a committee of the whole? Do you want me to confess to this? Do we know? <laughs> no, no, we know. Um, committees of the whole were created and I'm guilty of this. Um, because full board meetings, there's a federal register notice process and you have to plan like 37, 40 days ahead of time to do that. For business, and it often was informational kinds of things or discussion kinds of things, you wanted to invite everybody. It, it didn't fit in just one committee, but 
didn't want to go through the the bureaucracy of federal notices and and that formality. Mm -hmm. So committees of the whole are a little more nimble mm -hmm. um, as long as they're not decision making meetings. So it's a it's a board meeting mm -hmm. without decisions. So similar to in the city council space, it would be a a work a work session versus an official board meeting. Yeah. Okay, and and the generally single topic meetings. Okay. Perfect. Well, then that was going to be my my other question now actually relating to the committee structure that was here and the um, the idea of the of the resource teams and topics that cross committees. Not having a lot of past experience, my first thought was, well, why wouldn't you bring any discussion related to those topics to the committee of the whole? where there were representatives of all the committees to talk about a topic that perhaps impacts all committees rather than the added burden of having an individual, you know, issue subject matter expert having to attend multiple committee meetings to share that information, but rather everyone would benefit from hearing it as that whole group committee. That was my thought or question. Work group members, what do you think? So I can take the first stab. Um, the issue manager teams that we've had traditionally that be, that sort of write advice um, are more of a, a formal setting. Um, and the committee of the whole is uh, a cumbersome thing to plan. Uh, it, it takes a lot. There's a lot of moving parts in trying to set up a committee of the whole. So we typically have maybe one or two committees of the whole every year. I mean, it wouldn't be something that could be regularly put on. Um, so th this this uh, resource team idea is new and it's still um, open for discussion and, and uh, development. What what we sort of what I what I like to think of them of is, is like sort of book clubs. Um, so you have a group of people who sit around or um, have a call and and just discuss the topic, get up to speed on it, and then you have a 15 or 30 minute um, agenda item on on the committee meetings to say, hey, um, this document just dropped, uh, so you might want to take a look at it if you're interested in it, or this milestone update uh, sh should be coming up in the next couple months, and you know we might want to think about uh, you know keep your eyes out for it. It's not anything formal. Um, it, it's just more of a, a book club, in my opinion, but um, trying to get um, TPA updates or life cycle updates um, or budget updates um, and a, on a regular committee. We could we could also, I guess, have a regularly scheduled committee of the whole, but um, it, it might be a little more of a burden uh, for. The TPA agencies and the facilitation team. Chris, are you speaking to this? Yes. Go go for it. I think it depends entirely upon the topic too. So some topics, it might be that you want a resource team member or members to speak to the COTW because um, of the broad interest of the topics to all the members, just like you said. But I think there's other topics that might be unique to one or maybe two committees that maybe not everybody's gonna be interested in in those cases, it's probably more appropriate uh, to have the resource team member speak just to a committee or to several committees. So in large part, I think it depends upon the subject matter and the, and the topic. Right. The trivia is that the first committee of the whole was all about restructuring the committees that you currently have. Um, that's a story for another day. Jan, are you on this topic? OK, Dan Solitz, I know you're in queue. We haven't forgotten you. Sorry, Jan? sorry, Dan, I didn't know you were in queue. So I just wanted to say that when we started talking about resource teams, we were talking about what we, we call cross-cutting topics. And um, some of these cross-cutting topics you s seem to have been in committees that may not need to have a committee structure anymore. So uh, budget and contracts committee and uh, maybe HCEP. 
um, are cross-cutting. Everybody has a piece of that pie. And so when they were talking about putting together resource teams, what they were saying at that time or what we were saying at that time was that there would be a time on every committee meeting agenda for these resource people. And that might not always be appropriate for every meeting, but there might be updates. It might be short. You know, it might be that you get kind of picked up for those topics that are cross cross cutting in nature. And so that's why there's an interest in trying to find people who would like to represent those topics uh, as part of the resource um, cadre, if you will, that would attend meetings to give an update on those different topics. All right. Dan Solitz, you've been waiting. Yes. Jump in. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, just a clarification question. I've, I've heard that the, the non HAB folks, members who will be participating in committees uh, referred to as either members of the public or interested parties. Uh, and I'm wondering which one are, or if we're settling on both. Uh, I think it's important when you notify uh, the facilitation team that you want to be notified of, of committee meetings coming up as a member of the public or as an interested party. So is there one or are we going for both or So, Dan, I'm I'm trying to make sure I understand your question, so I give you a a, a decent answer. Are you asking how how people can become a a member of a committee, or if I have two email lists per committee? I'm sorry, I got lost. Well, uh, one is asking, you know, when you when you ask to become. If you're a member of the public and not a member of the habit, you want to go to these committee meetings and be notified of the committee meetings. Do you say, would you put me on the list as an interested party or would you put me on the list as a member of the public? And I've heard both in, in, in previous meetings. So I'm wondering if there is one term or if we're going to be using both terms. Yeah. Is that clear? I or yeah, I th I think I think the HAB has has total free reign of of what you call members of the public who want to participate on a committee. Um, there was a time when the facilitation team actually had interested parties lists for every committee, um, as well as the full board. That would be five committees. We didn't have an interested parties list for the EIC, but five committees and the board. Um, so six interested parties lists in addition to the lists for each committee and the board. Um, so as a as a tactical matter, we can we can make that happen, um, or just fold everything into a committee list, a single committee list. Um, so I I don't think it matters what you call it. I think it matters that we execute including the people who want to be included. Well. Okay. Would that also apply to the committee of the whole? Would members of the public or interested parties be able to go to the committee of the whole and and participate but not vote? Gary is shaking his head. Yes. Uh, thank you. And Tom Cecil, Tom Cecilia put something actually more in English in the chat. The mailing list is interested parties. That's what we call it but you can attend the meeting as a member of the public. Um, and we do, on our, the interested parties are notified of all board and committee meetings, including committee of the whole now. So we use that interested parties list and they get all the meeting notices. Uh, okay, thanks. Thank you. Pam and then Rob. I understand um, the breakout of committees. I think that the folks putting this together are optimistic that we're going to have enough people engage in these committee meetings. 
the resource teams make no sense to me at all. Um, it, and primarily because these are issues that are the expertise is DOE or the regulators, life cycle cost, funding, scope, um, a schedule and milestones. I mean, that's not a policy issue, that's a definitive issue. And then this waste and environmental permitting, that's an odd topic. And permitting is the state and EPA. So I understand that these are topics of interest to the committees and that having someone with expertise available to discuss them as necessary makes sense. Um, but someone says, I'm going to be scope and I'm going to participate in all these committee meetings because I'm scope. It doesn't make sense. So anyway, thank you. Okay, so Tom on this topic and then Rob. Tom? I, I definitely appreciate Pam's comment. Um, one thing we had discussed as being a potential um, with, the, with the agencies is to have um, sort of many meetings uh, on some of these topics where SMEs would be present to make sure that um, make sure that they were speaking to you know for permitting for instance having having the ecology permits folks come and, and talk to the resource group which then could be disseminated to all of the different committees as opposed to having that sme come talk to every committee um and this is obviously you know not not a uh, definitive plan uh this is all the conversation that we should be having and i appreciate it um, and hopefully by the committee of the whole, we've figured we've ironed out some details. Um, there's nothing that says that there has to be resource teams every year. Um, it could just be, you know, we're in a life cycle year. We should set up a resource team for that to do the like, like the type of thing Chris Sutton did where, where, you know, becoming the expert on that document and being able to report out to the board um, where it might be a challenge to get an agency brief. Um, but we can at least present what uh, what our our interpretation of the document is. Rob. <clears throat> yeah, I would say um, to me <clears throat> to me the committees of a whole have always been pretty much subject oriented and very informative and. Um, I don't want to ruin that. Um, I felt the last one we had was just fantastic, talking about permitting and and what we're going to do, RECRA, CERCRA, and that. Those are the kind of subjects that need to be deep dealt, um, or dealt deep, <laughs> one or the other. Um, but the, my, my point is, is that um, I would like to keep, I mean, we had committees of the whole where we, we for, was it two hours, we broke up, people went to a corner, listened to somebody talk, 15 20 minutes got up they went and put other put stickies on the wall we got ideas we 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 built on things we listened to people and um and i think those kind of committees of the whole are very important for this group um and yeah that's about what i'm gonna say thanks does that mean i can bring my sticky notes to the next committee of the whole <laughs> tom galliotto Uh, thanks again, Ruth. Uh, I also have a number of questions regarding uh, the resource teams, and I think they're too extensive to ask now, but it would be very helpful to have a complete description of how these resource teams will function, who is typically on them, how are they initiated, and and um, how they interact with the rest of the committees. It's It's confusing to me. And typically, for example, and let's case, look at the case of the AOA we just talked about, forming a, an IM team uh, currently uh, on addressing comments uh, from the tank waste committee, because it's kind of a tank waste issue, right? Well, the, typically that would require the tank waste team to meet, discuss various issues, and that's one that comes up. They decide that it's a significant issue and forms a, a resource team. How do they do that? Do they 
do they ask one of the tank waste committee members, uh, are you willing to lead a resource team, get resources from the rest of the HAB, make some announcements, get anybody interested, have some discussions and report back to only tank waste? Or is it at every one of these meetings that come up for all committees, do they report on everything that they're doing? I think there's a lot of interaction questions that really need to be addressed to understand if that's going to work. And right now, I, I, I don't see that, but thank you. Tom Cecilia. Hi, Tom. So um, preliminary ideas for how these teams would be would form would be um, the leadership workshop would say these are the topics that are going to be cross cutting this year. Um, you know, we should potentially uh, have a resource team for that. They would not replace IM teams for advice purposes or for like for the AOA for tanks. Um, it would just be for the cross cutting things. And like I said, this is still up in the air, but the, the concept is when you're doing the work plan, um, it's um, we know that there's documents coming or we know there's TPA changes coming and they're going to affect everybody. Um, so we either do a committee of the whole or we do an, an, a, a resource team on it. All right, so um, we've got just a couple of minutes. So I've got Chris and Dan Solitz in queue, and then we'll remind you of the next steps. Chris? Yeah, I agree with Tom um, Galeotto. There's a lot of unanswered questions, and everything you brought up, I think we brought up in the work group um, that we need to that we need to talk about and discuss. Um, but we're not there yet. Just another another thought, though, on all these all these topics, and this goes back to what Pam said: life cycle cost, funding scope. Every one of those things has been open at some time or another after a DOE or an ecology presentation for public comment. And when you look at a lot of the a lot of the comments that come from HAB board me, HAB board members on some of these topics, it seemed to me that a number of them would make really good topics also for potential advice. They are policy oriented. Some some of the some of the topics are not down the weeds, but at least since I've been on on the board, we've never had an IM team that is said, oh, this is a comment that we could make a potential advice out of, uh, a policy level advice. That's never happened, at least since I've been on the board. Uh, and I think one of the things that, that the resource teams could bring, if we had people in these different areas or other areas that might come up, is say, hey, here are topics for potential advice. And I don't think the committees or the IM teams would necessarily think about those. So I think it expands the scope of what the of what the board's responsibilities are in terms of providing advice and recommendations to the TPA. I think that's that's one of the big possible advantages of the resource teams is actually expanding our scope and what we recommend and what we advise. Right. Still, okay. we have to go through everything you said, all the all the fine details and how they're going to work. We do. All right. Dan, last comment on this topic before we wrap it's, it up and move on to the next one. It's just a, a, a quest for clarification. A leadership workshop, is that like the gang of six or, or what, what is a leadership workshop like that has to be by? The, the, the leadership workshop is an annual meeting of the executive issues committee. So, um, and the TPA agencies typically works on the work plan for the coming year as well as um, operational issues or a review of how things are going. It's it's an annual check-in and planning meeting. And I'm looking okay, around the you. table to make sure I got it right. Yeah. This year it's is scheduled for June. All right. So the next steps in this particular piece of work. Um, the operations work group, um, they've got a, a small group meeting in February to continue work on documents. Remember they talked about getting our documents 
filling in gaps, making them more in alignment, um, building in more clarity. Um, your committee meetings in February and March, um, you'll be invited to share your thoughts on the committee optimization proposals, including things you like or things you're confused about or, or want clarified. The committee of the whole will be on March 7th out at Wazoo. You'll get more information on that, I promise. Um, and it'll be focused on building out the details that you're talking about right now. How would this work? Um, or if it doesn't work, what's a different way of doing it? Um, so that committee of the whole is, is rolling up your sleeves and looking at implementation. Is, will it work for you? Um, and if so, what are the details that need to be ironed out? Um, and then anticipating that um, a more refined proposal would come to the board in April. So the refined proposal will go to the Executive Issues Committee in mid-March and hopefully to the full board in April. That's, that's the timeline that we're working to. So we're gonna shift gears. I want you to put on your outreach hat. Um, Dan Solitz, you're on deck to help me with this, but before we start, I'm gonna ask Mike Birkenbeil to kind of set the stage. Yeah, so a little little background on this. I'd like to um, offer to set us up for success in the in the next discussion that uh, uh, Dan is going to lead us off with. So, if you recall, the last time we were together, um, I'd made mention of um, uh, adding an agenda items to talk specifically about and provide examples of of how you're carrying a message back to your constituencies. Many of you have constituencies. I realize some that, that do not. Um, and then and then how that information comes back into the hab. So I know what occurs um, from time to time. I have one on one conversations and I, I hear it's occurring. So I'm not suggesting that 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 two way communication is not occurring. But in the time that I've had with the hab, rarely do have we come together and and been able to talk about hey, this is this is what I took to my constituencies. This is what this is what they say. Um, this was the dialogue that we had. And so the, the intent of this agenda item is to really begin that discussion, to set an example for having that discussion, perhaps at a regular um, as a regular agenda item, to, to, to benchmark each other, quite frankly. Um, and, um, and probably there's some, some opportunities for lessons learned or best practices. I'll tee it up that way. Um, one, one good example yesterday, um, uh, and I spoke with uh, Lorraine before I've uh, put Lorraine on the spot was in her remarks to Mr. Sixkiller about um, how specifically she carries information back to her constituency. And so that's the general light idea here. I know that uh, Dan has some remarks, but but you have a, hopefully an understanding of fundamentally where this came from and, and what's behind it. So with that, I'll turn it back. So when we were putting together the agenda, Dan Solitz volunteered to shepherd this discussion. He's the chair of the Public Involvement and Communications Committee, um, and that committee has something on its standing agenda called HAB self-assessments, um, which is the committee's version of what we're, we're trying to emulate here a little bit. Um, so, Dan, would you like to kick us off? Yes, uh, thank you. The self-assessment is more than just uh, taking it back to your constituency. It was a, also a discussion of, of uh, Taking it to just the general public, the the activities going on at Hanford and and uh, and your your ideas on them, uh, and it was generally a free ranging uh, 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 discussion. Not everybody participated, uh, and it was participation is kind of on a voluntary level only. Uh, there was a good example yesterday when when Max uh, uh, relayed a question that Ken Niles had. To the to the to the board, it was discussed at the Hanford uh, Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board, and then brought to uh, to the HAB. It's, it's a kind of a two way a two way thing, um, and, I, and I think we we would benefit by by not just limiting it to our particular constituency. My constituency would of course be the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board, but also um, I'm active on social media, and I get some feedback. Uh, from that, and, 
it's, it's kind of enlightening. And I think it would also be worthwhile discussing the difficulty of doing this. This is not a real popular subject, and it's kind of hard to bring it up to the general public. But from time to time, there are successful uh, conversations, and it's good to hear about those, kind of, kind of get an idea of how to, how to kind of carry those on, because uh, it's not always welcome. Uh, and it's kind of a, a conversation killer sometimes. So um, with that, uh, maybe the best thing to do is to, to open it up to, to folks who want to talk about how they've relayed uh, the HAB uh, process uh, back to uh, their own particular constituency, kind of a, asking for volunteers to, uh, to talk about that. Let's see how that goes. If nobody talks, then I'll just have to talk some more. So easy on yourself. I've got three cards up. I think people have ideas. Let's start with Jeff and then go to Pam and Chris. Thank you. Uh, following up on what Dan said, I thought it would give you a little bit of a rundown of what's going on in Oregon with some help from Max here. Uh, so the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board has three meetings a year. Um, we just had one a week or so ago, and we typically get updates from DOE Ecology and EPA. So there is some, some overlap, but uh, we like to think we get better updates from the agencies than the HAP does. Um, we um, are one of our priorities this year is to do more in in the area of public outreach and and i'll let max talk about the letter that he's uh, drafting right now um and we've uh, we've recently uh we've <clears throat> gone through roberto who's uh, given us some contacts in epa so we're investigating environmental justice and other uh public involvement grants uh, we've had uh a conference call with uh, some of the environmental um, uh, organizations in Oregon and have identified several opportunities that really uh, uh, kind of align around educational institutions and, and providing speakers and materials about Hanford there. And, um, and then we're also looking at uh, briefings of uh, congressional representatives and their staffs. And um, on the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board, we do have two, well, four legislators from the Oregon legislature, two senators and two representatives. So that's, uh, uh, and I'll turn it over to Max and he can talk about letters. Sure, all right. I'll maybe jump in the queue here. Sorry, Ruth. Um, <laughs> Yes, as Jeff mentioned, uh, there is uh, perhaps some overlap between the Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board and my work with the Oregon Department of Energy. Uh, independent of the, well, let me talk first about the letter that we're, we're contemplating or working on now. Um, it would be a letter very similar in style and tone and request as the governor's letter from last summer um, that Ecology and David Bowen spoke about earlier with the governor's Inslee and former Governor Brown of Oregon, as well as many other parties signed on to, a Brown funding for Hanford. Um, and we'd like to target that towards the Oregon congressional delegation, which has um, multiple new members based on the elections from the fall, uh, as always refreshers too for current members or previous members of Congress could use an update too. So that was that's one of the ideas. Um, I also, in my role, brief both up and down in my management chain um, around Hanford issues, um, both to my boss, who's the director of the Oregon Department of Energy, um, to the governor's office in the state of Oregon. Um, we have a new governor uh, as of a couple weeks ago now, and that staff is still being built out. And so um, uh, as soon as I can and able to, I'll have a, a meeting with the governor's policy directors around uh, natural resources and energy issues and talk about Hanford policy and what we do in that regard. Um, I also regularly have contacts with Oregon senators' um, staff in, in Oregon on natural resource policy issues, and Hanford comes up frequently in those conversations. Um, we also talk with our local constituents, particularly in Morrow and Umatilla counties in Oregon. Um, they have uh, members from those communities are on the Oregon Hanford board and they have independent relations with staff at the county level that we talk about Hanford policy issues. So those are probably some of the more important ways that I maintain uh, transfer of knowledge and information sharing and hearing what's um, what might be priorities from our constituents 
uh, particularly, as I mentioned, the, the people I talked about. And then, uh, honestly, more often than not, it's me sharing out what's happening because Hanford policy issues aren't always forefront in people who aren't living and breathing it every day like some of us are. All right, I've got Pam, Chris, and Rob. Pam. Thanks. Um, I was asked to share um, how um, we coordinated with Hanford Communities and, and what I do as um, the appointee from Benton County. So I'm going to go back to my previous job, which I retired from three years ago as director of Hanford Communities. Um, each of the four cities in the two counties um, appoint an elected official to be on the board of the Hanford Communities, um, and they meet quarterly. As a member of the Hanford Advisory Board, um, I was able to identify topics that I thought would be of interest uh, to those elected officials um, and arrange for speakers. Uh, on numerous occasions, we filmed those presentations and made them available on local access television. Um, uh, one good example was a status report on the waste treatment plant. So we had um, the president of Bechtel locally, um, we had ecology, um, DOE, um, and it was a panel of about four or five people um, that provide information from their perspective about what was going on. Um, and so then each year, um, I made a presentation to the elected officials of each jurisdiction to summarize what had happened during the year at Hanford. And I did that in partnership, for example, with Rob, when we went to the city of Pasco, um, I presented from Hanford community's perspective and Rob does a report from the Hanford advisory board. And that's also um, what we do with Benton County um, that hap will happen uh, during the month of February. So it, it, it gives um, the elected officials of each jurisdiction an overview, gives them an opportunity to ask questions, um, gives them an opportunity to um, interact um, with folks. And um, last year, interestingly, um, Bob Suyama, who was also um, a HAB member from Bend County, talked about the HAB reorganization. <laughs> and his disappointment with what was going on. And um, he's no longer with us. So he expressed his disappointment um, pretty clearly. Uh, so anyway, it's, I, I think it's worked really well and it um, uh, it's, it's an opportunity for dialogue and information sharing. So that's what we do. Thank you. Thank you. Chris and then Rob. Um, Pam may have uh, co-opted my 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 question. So this may be a little redundant, but I was I was pretty curious about the members of the board who represent government agencies like the various cities: Pasco, Kennewick, Richland, West Richland, Benton County, Franklin County. Um, what exactly uh, do they do? Who do they report to? What do they give? But more important, what kind of feedback do they get? And does that feedback from those government agencies? translate back here into the into the hab in any way um so i'd be i'd be curious if uh, those representatives might be willing to to speak up because i don't have a clue huh? right so i've got rob jan and michelle and i'm guessing that there's some answers to your questions in and what's coming. I'm winking at Michelle. Rob? All right. I hope this is close enough. Uh, my my question is actually some, somewhat similar to uh, uh, Chris's question. Uh, when it comes to this term we're throwing around, constituencies, uh, my, I guess, group indicates it's non-union non-management and i guess i'm not really sure what how how am i supposed to handle that as far as getting input or for providing information to whoever this this group of people is and uh, it looks like uh, some of the uh 
the representatives that we have here, it's 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 a little more clear who that group of people uh, that they need to either provide input or uh, uh, accept some kind of feedback that can be brought back to the board. But with my group and like you know public at large, what does that mean? You know, uh, how how do we go about? Uh, getting information from this group we're supposed to be representing and how do we provide information back to that group? Uh, I guess being, being new to the group and I'm, I'm not really sure what that process is, what this even means to me. Um, let me take a stab at this. The, the HAB was created as a board of interests and there are a handful of exceptions to that. The public at large seats are one asking Sue to represent the entire public at large is a really big ask. That's why I have Chris. That's why she has Chris. <laughs> <laughs> the non-union non-management seats are similar in that the representatives for those seats don't represent the entire non-union non-management workforce because we don't want your head to explode but they are selected from that group of people so that there is a perspective from that group of people, but you're not representing an organization or a constituency in the same way that many of the others at the table do. Um, so th there is an acknowledgement in the, in the design of the HAB that you're actually not expected to go out and, and survey all the non-union, non-management to see what they want. You're, you're more like a public at large who was selected from a specific category of folks. Does that help a little bit? Yeah, so there are some, some nuances in some of the seats. Ginger, you've been around a lot. Do you have some thoughts to help me out here? Is it on now? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Ginger Wireman. I'm with the Department of Ecology. I work with Ryan to do outreach and education. Uh, last night, you guys saw the outreach I've managed to do this year. Um, but there's something that all of you could do right now as you're sitting, well, maybe not right now, but during your break or afterwards, go to the listserv where you were invited to do the survey and share it to your friends. That's how you can gather information and share information, push information out to people. I mean, we're really hoping this year's survey, um, the way we framed it is we actually want to hear from the people who haven't been paying attention. Why aren't they paying attention? And um, so if you have Facebook or social media, go find the survey link on the Facebook post at the Department of Ecology Hanford page and share that. Um, the other thing is, all of you, if you have friends, family, cousins who are in Rotary or Kiwanis or Lions or the Chamber of Commerce, um, DOE has people that will go visit them and talk about Hanford, and I will go visit people and talk about Hanford. And when Pam had the Hanford Communities contract um, through Ecology to help fund Hanford Communities, part of her job um, was to actually do the cold calling and lining up a lot of those speaking engagements. And we don't have anybody doing that anymore. So, you know, I have to go to a website and shoot an email off or use a contact form that somebody who may not be technologically savvy may stumble onto that email in their Rotary Club inbox three months later. So if you actually know somebody that you can share my contact or DOE communications contact with, Please do that. All right. Lots of folks to share ideas. I've got Jan and then Michelle. So I'm so glad Ginger spoke up because when I was um, appointed as public at large, I was associated with an organization in Bellingham that's partially sponsored by the Western Washington University called the Academy of Lifelong Learning. And so um, I, I organized and brought two classes to the Academy of Lifelong Learning, one in cooperation with 
uh, Dieter Bormann and who's the guy, uh, McDonald, what's his first name? Anyway, they came out and did a class for a group of people from the Academy of Lifelong Learning. And subsequently we did it again with Ginger. Ginger came out to Bellingham and, uh, and she and I gave a class um, on topics of interest having to do with the Hanford site. Um, when I moved from public at large to uh, representing the Washington State League of Women Voters, my interest group expanded from our local unit from Bellingham, Whatcom County, to where I had an opportunity from time to time to speak to the uh, Washington State president of the League of Women Voters. And at one point, she contacted me to ask about, you know, television reports that we get about leaking tanks. You know, it's always a bad look, you know. And so I wrote a uh, kind of response to her in the email about pump and treat facilities and how, um, you know, in the beginning, so much of that waste was just poured onto the ground. Eventually they figured out to put it in tanks and um, now the tanks are leaking, but the pump and treat facilities is working to get the contaminants out of the ground. And it's certainly doing it at a much more rapid rate and more effectively um, at, compared to the small amount of leaking tanks. So um, that kind of is the kind of information that people need if they're gonna evaluate these, these um, television reports, these investigative reports. And she turned around and published it in the state newsletter. You know, my comments to her were published in the state news newsletter. So, you know, that's the way somehow working with your constituency. But further, um, now that I'm looking forward to, or like with regrets, looking forward to leaving the Hanford Advisory Board, I'm now, I've been solicited to serve on the state board of um, the Washington State League of Women Voters. So the interest that I will be bringing to that if I am selected is I think I would like to be on nominations. I would like to be able to have some uh, platform to look around to the various local units in the state of Washington and find out who the people are who are interested in climate issues. We have a climate committee in Bellingham, um, you know, and there certainly are, you know, it's hard to say where, you know, cause Susan Leckbend was the representative from this local unit for the League of Women Voters. And, um, but there are people all over the state, I'm sure that have an interest in HAB and how it's done. So um, that's what I'm looking forward to and something of what I have done in the past. Right, we've got a couple things in the chat before I go to Michelle. There is a Hanford Speakers Bureau program. Um, and if you're interested in that, um, Patrick Conrad and Amber Peters coordinate that out of HMIS. We can uh, connect you there. Um, and a link to the TPA Agency Public Involvement Survey. Not only is it on the Ecology uh, Facebook page and website, it will also, that link will be in the weekly update you get later today. So that link's gonna be a number of places um, and they really wanna hear from you. Michelle. Well, I think the, the question about the local governments was just as interesting to me as everybody else, because as the Council of Governments, we are, our governing board is made up of uh, representatives of all the other local governments. So when I first came to uh, the HAVE board representing the COG, I'm going, okay, well, who should I be reporting information back to? Because Pam is here for the counties and John is here for West Richland, et cetera, and Tom's here for TRIDEC. And so the people locally that we would normally um, provide information back to already have good conduits to that information, Rob for Pasco. Um, but what the Council of Governments does and where I'm seeing probably my best opportunity to liaise with the HAB is that 
um, on behalf of all of those local governments, we uh, have designations that administer programs uh, that in some way uh, dovetail with federal partners or activities um, um, at, Ham at Hanford. So for example, we are the Metropolitan Planning Organization for Ben and Franklin counties under the Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Transit Authority, uh, and WashDOT. And so when we talk about employee issues for uh, transportation concerns going out to uh, the facilities and, and those kinds of things, we can be a conduit for those concerns from employees or issues with the HAB back to organizations like uh, Ben Franklin Transit or their solutions or advice that could be brought to bear to help solve those kinds of problems. Uh, we coordinate with the Economic Development Administration as the Economic Development District for Benton and Franklin counties, different from TRIDEC, where TRIDEC is, is working to recruit, retain, retain um, and grow industry and the economy of the region. We actually study and, and plan for both economic and, um, uh, and uh, transportation-related uh, issues for the region. So studying issues of mutual interest and concern uh, for communities within Benton and Franklin County. So there's a lot of, of, of connectivity potentially for those things. But one of those studies we produce and maintain is the comprehensive economic development strategy. And obviously, Hanford and all of the nuclear related um, activities for the region have a huge impact on the economy here and a huge focus for the um, Economic Development Administration and and studies of late, especially after COVID is what happens when there's an, a, an economic shock. Uh, caused by a natural or man-made disaster. Most recently, it was COVID. Um, but uh, equally, we've seen many, many communities uh, be impacted or, or have an economic shock because of a downturn in employment or uh, other activities, closures of facilities as cleanup progresses and workforces uh, change. So for us, um, having that information to monitor and add into our planning activities uh, becomes important to talking about uh, community economic resiliency and perhaps other issues. So for me, I think, uh, at least for my interest in the local governments, uh, participation is going to have more to do with feedback uh, to and from those planning studies than actual reports back to the local governments themselves because that's being handled elsewhere. Thank you. All right, I've got Steve Anderson and then Rob Davis. Steve. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, uh, my perspective comes a, a little bit different and maybe it's slightly dysfunctional. I kind of agree with uh, some of the questions that Rob brought up, which was, uh, you know, why, why and who do I and how do I and all of those things. I definitely don't have the uh, formal education and background related to, uh, to what Pam brings, which is very impressive. And I'm always uh, uh, taken by all of her efforts and activities to uh, represent. Um, I think my representation comes from the quest, uh, request that was made to me by Brad Peck says, hey, I'd like to have somebody there uh, for Franklin County. I didn't even realize it was Grant County too. Um, but we do have pretty strong, I think, uh, support for the Tri-Cities here. And I've always felt that there's a, a gap missing. I'm not running up to Grant County talking about Hanford, quite frankly. And so I was... Uh, Really excited when Gary said, "Well, we've got some applications out. We hope that alternative might be, you know, Grant Grant County representative." That didn't happen, but I thought that that was um, very prudent to try to make sure that there's some balance in what we do. Um, I am uh, uh, the president of the uh, Clean Energy Supplier Alliance, which was the TCLBA group, which is small local businesses related to Hanford activities. So I do um, talk to that. We have had Pam. Uh, do that in the past um, so it's a group of uh, folks but beyond that it's um who steve knows in his little social umbrella so uh, i talked to people and that was actually part of the the reason why i ended up here is that um there was uh, quite a bit of just general negativity to the what 
Hab was able to accomplish and why it even existed. And I didn't, I didn't think that was fair. I've been a part of uh, uh, several different um, legislative groups, uh, CURB in Olympia for a number of years as chair there. And I understood that things aren't going to evolve as quickly as most people would love to see happen. But I also felt that it wasn't fair that uh, there was a, a, a number of um, uh, reflective comments that I didn't think um, were very well justified. I've been on the board now for just a couple of years. It is a bit cumbersome. It is a bit slow. But part of the reason that I'm here is that I firmly believe that uh, we need to have public involvement in cleanup and making sure that uh, the words are heard. You're just going to hear mine. So uh, if you don't like what my perspective is, then uh, maybe I'll go away. Um, but clearly, I think that I bring another um, avenue of uh, understanding, uh, which is what we're all here about, providing our different perspectives. And uh, and I do think that it um, it it is having an impact. I do think that uh, DOE is paying attention, and I'm I'm grateful for um, the requirements that they have to to listen. And uh, and I I think they're sincere in their efforts and. So, um, yeah, if there's any other vehicles, and I, I do appreciate and love the fact that Ginger Weirman is out there promoting and talking to it. Um, I think she has a good flair for that. I, I'm not maybe that flair person, but I do think that uh, we could all do a little bit more to reach out, and I'm, I'm one of those. Thanks. I just want to add that I went to the Grant County. They have a new emergency services group and I went and spoke to them in October. <laughs> so we haven't forgotten Grant County. All right, I've got Rob and then Mia and then John. Rob. Um, I, I, <clears throat> I think you've already heard how we talk with our city council and, and mayor and that, but, but I wanna bring up a, another twist to this where in the earlier days of this board, um, our non-union, non-management, our union and management people, and those representatives, um, you know, I, I don't want to say that like, they rat on situations out there, but there are situations out there that we have handled through our advice that were being ignored by the powers to be. Things like um, the beryllium program, things like the vapors, um, the corroding cribs. We wouldn't have known about them had not photographs come out in the committee meetings that, that people can talk about. Oh, that's what it looks like. Um, things like um, the tank lead. Had that the tank waste committee not finished the advice to ask DOE to work with ecology to come up with an agreement on what to do with leaks, we wouldn't have that. In my opinion, we wouldn't have had that. So, so I think that the board is more than just finding out what our people we represent want, but it's also listening to DOE and listening to the project and, and paying attention. And, and, and by golly, some of the, the people that we get from that work out there are very much experts on what they do and health and safety. You know, just think about the mock-ups that we now do for like the 324 and that. They were kind of unheard of 10 years ago. We didn't have the budgets for those. And so, um, so this board and those committees serve more than simply what information are we going to relay one way out. We, we also need to relay information to the DOE. And we do that through our membership. So I just want to point out that we don't lose that ability over time. Thank you. Mia and then John. Mia? Yeah, um, I do a lot of the education and outreach for Hanford Challenge. And I find this board really valuable in terms of uh, sharing information and then being able to ask a lot of questions and then bringing that information back to our members. So in terms of examples, um, I did the mock -up, the tour of the mock -up, 324 mock-up facility and shared um, photos after that on social media and had a wonderful reaction from, from people that are our followers and lots of likes and thank you and things like that. 
Um, DOE has shared videos with us um, during HAB meetings, and I've tried to share, reshare those on our social media. Um, we launched a nuclear waste scholar series last April and actually invited a fellow former HAB member, uh, Vince Panesco, to talk about ancient lake beds um, it, to a broader audience of people who had probably never heard about that before. And it was a topic that he had brought up in, in the HAB. Um, and so it was, it's all these things that you learn about in this smaller space that, you, that we try to share out to, to members of the public and our membership and make it a little more understandable because sometimes it gets a little weedy here. And so we try to translate um, the language to make it more plain and accessible. Thank you. John. Yes, uh, I'm representing the city of West Richland, and uh, I think it's an excellent question how how PAB members transfer information uh, to and from the community. community. Um, so I primarily report back to the city council and there are citizens, of course, and so I'm always uh, looking for information that um, that directly relates to their sort of overarching interests. And uh, Michelle hit on a couple of them uh, with respect to employment um, outlooks. Uh, Rob brought up some great points for specific issues that, that seem to hit the news and that people are interested in. Um, those sort of hopefully might be more rare, <laughs> um, but they do happen and that's always a, that's always a, a good function for us here is to uh, help with understanding and get that communication back to our constituents. Um, I think that some overarching uh, concerns and things that I keep my ears open for here, uh, being a short term, short time member so far, uh, I think this may be my third meeting. Um, the are things like, uh, you know, if I had to try to think about what I've heard comments from citizens and not just while well, during my short stay here on the board, but but over the years would be things like um, access to Hanford lands. You know, a lot of people in the Tri-Cities, especially those that are new, you know, they, they really have this wonder, like, why can't we travel across that piece of desert? Uh, why can't we ride our bikes? Uh, why can't we get to the top of Rattlesnake Mountain? Um, uh, why, why, why do we have to sign up for a special tour to go see the old Hanford schoolhouse? Um, you know, why can't we access the shoreline? Uh, and so this is, I mean, I understand why at this point, but also understand that that progress could be made there and the public in general would appreciate um, progress in those areas of just access to the land, maybe converting it into BLM land or something that's more open more open or historical sites that can be visited without a bus tour. Um, employment outlook like Michelle hit on was another thing that of course the city is keenly interested in for planning purposes, uh, you know, decisions as to whether or not to engage in making a new uh, waste uh, water treatment plant. Um, should we spend another $11 million on a, on a well? Uh, what's the growth outlook for the city? Um, these are decisions that, uh, you know, information from this board and from the Hanford site um, can affect. And then uh, river health, you know, everybody enjoys the Columbia River uh, for, um, you know, both irrigation and potable water, of course. Uh, we get some of our potable water from the Columbia River uh, through Richland and uh, fishing and recreation, of course, everybody enjoys that. It's a concern and so reports of that nature that um, inform the public of, of the, uh, you know, the fact that the water's still clean and there hasn't been any incidents and they can let their kids swim in the river. You know, those are, those are obvious, but um, important things that our community is interested in. So uh, I appreciate the question. I think it's important. So I'm not, uh, didn't necessarily get appointed to the board to provide uh, technical um, assistance. Uh, I have a background in radiation detection and environmental sampling, but um, really I'm here to serve the citizens of West Richland and, uh, you know, to um, be that conduit of information between what the HAB discusses and, and, and what the interests of the citizens are. So thank you for the opportunity. All right. 
We've got about five minutes and I've got a couple of cards. We're going to hard stop at 1030 because we do have public comment today. So I've got Jeff and Pam. A uh, quick comment, the Tri-Cities Business Journal does a Hanford issue every spring, and uh, they've solicited an article from us in Oregon. And I know DOE and Ecology have had uh, kind of op-ed pieces in that in the past. So just an FYI, there may be other organizations here that might be interested in submitting articles for that issue. But what your chair doesn't know yet is they've asked or someone from the HAB as well. We just weren't going to inflict that on her until next week. <laughs> Gee, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> now she's going to swat me. <laughs> Pam. Um, one other topic um, uh, which has um, evolved is emergency management. And um, in my capacity uh, with Hanford Communities, I was the liaison between the Benton County Emergency Operations Center and the federal EOC and also Energy Northwest. And um, it, uh, fortunately, over the years, um, as Hanford cleanup has progressed, it has become difficult to come up with a scenario of something bad happening at Hanford that's going to require um, uh, emergency um, response or release of radioactivity. When we had the plutonium finishing plant in operation, um, there were always potential issues. Um, and um, <clears throat> currently, it's basically the cesium and strontium capsules in WESF uh, that could provide a release to the environment. But um, it, in, so I was in the federal EOC uh, when we had the collapse of the tunnel um, and had an opportunity to observe um, how everyone uh, interacted. And I, I can tell you that the, uh, I was very impressed um, with DOE as, as well as everyone else's participation. But um, for um, potential to the people in this region, um, it, 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 the planning was, was well executed. People were ready uh, to respond promptly. and um, the potential uh, for something happening is very minute at this point in time. Thank you. Dan Solitz, I want to thank you for helping us shepherd this session. Do you have any final thoughts? Uh, just uh, two, the, the outreach and the, I think two prong. One is to uh, ensure that the cleanup is conducted properly and that the citizens are aware of what's going on and the others pass the word on to future generations for intergenerational equity what little of it that is is left so that a uh, hundred years from now or a thousand years from now people still know what went on here and uh, if they have to deal with what they need to do thank you mike you kick this off do you want to close this out i do great job team um i had anticipated how the conversation might go. Um, I'd like to say that your responses exceeded anything I'd anticipated. I gave myself a little scorecard to see how well the ask was was um, answered. And part of that is, did I did I communicate it? Did I articulate it? So either I did, or you've learned to be able to speak, Mike. And and um, that's kind of a scary place to be. But um, I heard a lot of the how um, and the who. Um, you communicate with. There's been some discovery in that. There's also some of the what, what has been shared in the past, what has been shared in the present. And I'm hopeful that this conversation can can continue, that that you'll um, embrace an agenda item for that and um, and bring it into all the present where we're talking about what is being shared and, and what thoughts are articulated, whether, whether or not they're from you as an individual, as a member of the public or a Rob and others that are in situations like you, Rob. Um, and that that conversation can continue. I want to pitch uh, for the uh, PIC committee um, and uh, participation in the PIC committee. Steve, I, I was thinking about some of your remarks and um, uh, the value you could add in help shaping uh, negative perceptions, changing those perceptions from negative to positive about, about the have. Um, any, any level of participation is encouraged. Um, and then also um, a, a pitch for Ginger. Um, when I have had the opportunity to speak uh, either about the PIC committee during the work group or with the PIC committee. Um, outreach is um, 
uh, something that, uh, as, as you heard me say yesterday, I had the three O's. I had um, orientation, operations, and outreach as being something that, that I have some energy on. Um, what ecology is, is doing, um, what EPA is doing, um, also specifically um, what Ginger is doing, I think there's some, some opportunities for us to benchmark and carry that forward. And uh, 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 I don't want to say reconstitute, but strengthen our outreach. And so I appreciate the conversation today, and, and thank you for that. All right. Before we go to break, we have public comment. And we do have public comment. I know of two people who wish to speak, um, and we will ask if anyone else wishes to speak after we do those two. So, Tom Galeotto, you're first on my list. It is on. Well, thanks, Ruth, for the opportunity to do this. Um, in, in case you're not familiar with the process, even though I'm a HAB representative on the board, um, we all have a right to speak publicly. And the reason I've chosen to do that today is because uh, I've done a lot of thinking over the last 12 hours or so between when we saw the briefing on the, um, the new approach on the work group uh, that we heard and this morning when we came back and had another discussion of it. Um, I have not had a chance in that time period to discuss this with uh, uh, my organization that I'm representing, in this case, TriDec. Uh, usually I would do that and, and see if we're in agreement on positions and comments uh, if, as appropriate. Uh, that was not done. So instead of commenting as uh, a representative from TRIDEC, I'm commenting as a public. That being said, uh, I, I view the, the uh, work group activities as uh, extremely important to the HAB. It's, it's something that uh, it may not be a, uh, an eight on the Richter scale, but it's approaching five, in my opinion. And I think that the work group has done a great job I really appreciate the the briefing that they provided to us yesterday and some of the discussion this morning. Uh, there's obviously a lot of details to fill in yet, and I think everyone recognizes that. Um, but what we're trying to deal with uh, and overcome, and again, in my opinion, is um, several years of of uh, difficulty uh, in specific instances between the HAB and, and uh, the tri-party agencies, in particular DOE, because DOE is the lead organization there. Uh, it all boils down to rebuilding trust. Uh, we've lost some of that trust. We've, we've had occasions from the, from the HAB side, in, in, again, in my opinion. Uh, we've seen things like uh, lack of follow-up uh, to requests, uh, not able to discuss topics that we think are important because of timing issues potentially or availability of personnel and SMEs from the, from the department. Uh, we've seen loss of uh, a tremendous amount of uh, um, intellectual knowledge and tribal knowledge within the HAB over the last year, and we're gonna see more of that this year. Um, so there, there, there is a feeling of, um, the potential feeling of distrust that we have to overcome. In order to be successful in the HAB and with DOE and DOE's success, we have to really come together as a team. And I, I'm beginning to think that we're not quite there yet. We've got our work cut out for us. But, I, but the effort is certainly worth, worth it. Uh, the accomplishments that we're gonna make, if we do that, are, are tremendous. Um, I, I do hand it to DOE. Uh, they had, I felt that the presentations yesterday were great. Uh, they had a lot of progress and a lot of accomplishments, reports issued, um, a lot of accomplishments on site, in fact, uh, being recognized uh, for the teams of excellence that, on um, the groundwater and, uh, and DF law, I think it was. But, um, but I would focus our attention on how do we proceed from here? How do we build the trust again? Openness and communication are key items in that. And my only advice to 
the uh, work group. I th again, I think they've they've done a good job in in getting us to where we are today. Um, is to be very open and 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 gain acceptance through the HAB completely. Uh, we have a couple of things coming up, right? The, co the Committee of the Whole is coming up in March. The full HAB again in in April, or yeah, I guess that's right. The next two things, Committee of the Whole and the full HAB, that we'll as a group be able to see where we are with that effort. Um, I want to stress with everyone, all the me members, and I think the committee of the, or of the uh, work group did this already. I'll reemphasize it. It's critical that we all understand what's being done here in terms of well, the direction we're taking, which is different. Not only the committee names, but the resource team application and consolidating uh, uh, directive documents like the MOU and uh, some of the guidance from EMSSAB. A lot of things are going on there that that are going to take a lot of work, but also a lot of understanding in detail as to how this is going to work for us. We don't want to broadly not inform ourselves of the effort and get to a point where we're going to be voting on something in full HAB meeting in April that we really aren't fully familiar and comfortable with. So please pay attention to that. Look at the documents. Participate as the as the work group has suggested, I think we've got some ground to cover on built, rebuilding trust, and I'm hopeful that we can get there. Yeah, thank you. Next, we have Shelly Simone. Shelly is online with us. So, Shelly? Thanks, Ruth. Good morning to everybody. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I was one of one member of the leadership for the board for many, many years. And uh, uh, the last few years, as Tom Galeotto just said, we're pretty darn tough in, in not seeing committees uh, being able to access the subject matter experts and uh, discuss the topics uh, that were important to them. And I think it's really important for this board to understand that where your strength lies is in a process that everyone understands and that is very um, streamlined. I really agree with Pam uh, in her query about, you know, do we really, if the HAB is the hub, uh, the board meetings and the committees are next on the spoke, is there really a need for another layer out there uh, as a third tier on that spoke in order to develop uh, topics? I, do, I don't think so. I think that you need to really look and stress as a board, uh, a, a streamlined process that makes it very simple where you are in the development uh, of advice, of uh, participation by as many, you know, the ability for as many people as possible to particip participate in the committee structures so that everyone can be on the same page when it's time for the board to take a look at advice that's been developed. That's imperative and that's where the strength of this board uh, lies. When the committees met uh, in the past, they were they were the hubs for the development of advice. Tri-party agencies came with saying, you know, we need some understanding. Uh, this is something we're talking about right now. What do you guys think? And they throw that on the table. Board members, committee members could throw ideas on the table. And, and we could ask for subject matter experts to come and talk and we all talked collaboratively. And the word is collaboratively and transparent. And that's incredibly important for this board to carry forward with. You're all volunteers, mostly. And uh, time is uh, precious. And to string this out with another layer doesn't seem like a very advantageous thing to do for the board. In the committees, uh, everyone had the opportunity to hear the to look at the topics, to hear everybody's weigh in on it, and then at that point, make a decision on whether something was worthy of advice. There was something that was a nugget that needed to come forward. Didn't happen all the time, not at all, but everyone understood the lay of the land a lot better in those discussions, and that's really important. And it was at that point that the committee members then decided, you know, let's form a team who's interested 
and have that team work up a draft. And, uh, and there was consensus within that committee. And that's what went forward. Very simple process, very simple process, and very clear cut. And uh, what's the nugget is the transparency and uh, the ability to, to, to move forward quickly. So I, I hope you won't lose sight of that in these deliberations of how this board is going to work differently. Because I think there's tremendous burnout when there isn't a process that's clear and easy and succinct uh, for the board to make decisions in a framework. Also, uh, another thought I have that really is, is for the long term is that uh, as other sites finish their cleanup, they're gone. They're gone from the, the lobbying table of needing budgets. And there will be a time when this is the only site that's gonna be lobbying for big monies and it's gonna become a regional issue, not a national issue. And this board is gonna be even more important to the Northwest than it is now. And it's very important to the Northwest now because it's gonna be up to all of us in the Northwest to link arms and lobby for the monies that are gonna be needed to get the rest of the waste vitrified. So that's something to think about uh, in the long term as we move forward. And, uh, and I just wanted to throw that thought out there. Ruth, thanks very much. That's it. Thank you, Shelley. Is there any anyone else either online or with us here in the room who wishes to make public comment? Anyone? All right, with that, we're gonna break until 11. And we come back um, and do some some board business. We're going to talk about the upcoming membership appointment package, um, as well as general board business and looking ahead to your future meetings and calls. So please come back at eleven. All right. So. And we've got 22 people online. Just so you think, you think, oh, the room's getting a little less people. There's still 22 people online. So what we wanted to do at 11, right on time, you guys are great, um, was get an update on the next HAB membership appointment packet um, and how that's going. Um, and I don't know, Mike or Gary, which which are you? Mike's going to start. Do we have everybody back? Okay. Are we good? Yeah, I don't want folks to miss out. Um, I'm going to go ahead. So um, uh, I've been asked to, to speak to this, and I've got some uh, notes that have been prepared for me. Um, and uh, with that, I would say that um, uh, please, EPA, um, Ecology, Gary, um, if there's some additional information you'd like to add, um, I invite you to do that. So uh, the period that we're going to talk about is September 1st to December 31st. So September 1st, 2022, December 31st, 2022. Um, and our approach has been a collaborative effort between DOE Ecology, EPA, Washington Governor's Office, have, Washington Governor's Office, have members, um, very of variable means, uh, phone calls, emails, personal outreach, social media, et cetera. Um, there are 38 seats, primary, 28 alternate. Um, filled presently, there are 35 um, and uh, 20 alternate seats. Um, there are no alternates for the public at large. Um, two organizations, new organizations to the table have been the Tri-City um, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and Columbia Basin College. Uh, departing organizations, Citizens for Clean Eastern Washington and uh, University of Washington for this package. Um, not filled seats, there are three, uh, Central Washington Building Trades Council, Regional Public Health Concerns, and Washington State University, an alternate member um, has a current ap appointment there. For primaries, there are five uh, primary renewals uh, for Benton County, Pasco, um, Richland, Hanford Atomic Metal Trades Council, and uh, Oregon Department of Energy. Um, in that uh, balance, there are uh, three that um, need term limit extensions. Continuing primaries, we have 14, uh, Grant and Franklin counties, Benton Franklin Council of Governments, West Richland, Umatilla Tribe, Nez Pierce Tribe, Yakima Nation, 
and um, the Oregon Citizens Advisory Board. Did I get that right, Jeff? The name of your board, Jeff. Yeah. Oregon Hanford Cleanup Board. My word. Okay. I don't know who came up my with apologies. that. It wasn't me. Yeah, my apologies, sir. Um, Non-union, non-management, Hanford Challenge, Heart of America Northwest, Washington Policy Center, Ben Franklin Health District, and Columbia River Keeper. New primaries, um, City of Kennewick, Tridec, Richland Rod and Gun Club, League of Women Voters, Tri City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and Columbia Basin College. Uh, termed out in this period, um, individual from Richland Rod and Gun Club, as you heard, replaced. League of Women Voters, the same, and the University of Washington. Um, not renewing for this period, uh, Tridec, um, specifically Tom Galliotto. Galliotto? Yeah. Uh, Citizens for Clean Eastern Washington, Denise Jones, and Washington State University, Alan Felsot. So alternate renewals, we have three, uh, City of Pasco, Tridec, Columbia Riverkeeper, and continuing alternates, there are 12 uh, for the City of West Richland, Hamtech, Umatilla, Yakima Nation, Hanford Challenge, Heart of America Northwest, Washington State University, Oregon, uh, DOE. Uh, new alternates, Benton County, Grant Franklin Counties, Oregon DOE, um, Richland Rod and Gun Club, public at large, no renewals. There are four continuing. Um, there are six new members and two not renewing. Any additions to that for comments? Ryan, Roberto, Gary? Uh, this uh, is Ryan. Ryan. I um, actually, sorry, Roberto, you go ahead. I was just going to say what you're about to say. Okay, I was going to say, uh, I think Mike, you meant Oregon Department of uh, uh, Oregon DOE, not not US DOE. Um, you just said DOE, so I was just clarifying. Um, and I, I meant to say new, Oregon. <laughs> you're good. And I should share the names for the. You, you said that we're having six new public at large members. I just wanted to share that those the folks those folks are Larry Brandt, Robin Pretty, Brian Moreno, Brad Bricker, Charmaine uh, Lonergan, and Joey Matthew. And I probably uh, mispronounced a couple of those names, but those are the, the public at large members in this packet. Yeah, and uh, I guess to taking a step back regarding the, the HAB recruitment, um, this past year, uh, Gary, Ryan, Mike, and myself, uh, we've been working collaboratively uh, with this and uh, trying to seek uh, new organizations to fill uh, these vacancies, as well as uh, ensure that we can continue to act the participation uh, of the board. And I think that we're off to a good start. It's not perfect, but I think we're off to a good start. Gary? Yes, thank you. And I, and I would like to echo Roberto's comments is that uh, it was a very collaborative, uh, very transparent process between the three agencies, something that had not been done to this level in the past. Uh, and, and frankly, I'm very proud of, of the work that was done. And, and the amount of recruitment could not have been done by one agency alone. It was done by all three agencies doing a lot of the heavy lifting. It was also done by many of our stakeholders who were involved in the process in coming up with names of new nominees and folks like that. So I'm very appreciative of the effort of the HAB members uh, who helped out with that. Um, we're, we are also working on new ways of, of getting uh, of the packet approved on time. I know that one of the issues that we've had over the past few years is uh, getting the package approved. And what we've done is we had a little bit longer uh, recruitment time. Typically, we had been doing it over only about a month or so, and it had been done during the holiday season. Doesn't work too well. And we found that out and we learned from that. So we had a, a fall recruitment drive. And frankly, recruitment is a 365 day a year process. 
we don't have to wait until these windows open. If you come across somebody who might be a good candidate, let's talk. Uh, we, we won't accept the application formally until the recruitment cycle, but the door is always open because people's lives will change during a session and we may have one or two people resign and we may have an unexpected vacancy that we will look to fill. So be thinking about that as you go along. The other part is that uh, in order for us to have an October 1st appointment date, we typically would have to have all of our paperwork into headquarters in April. Well, we are shooting for a Labor Day, September 1st-ish uh, appointment date, so we can have everybody in place and then potentially do some uh, new member recruitment before October. So what we're planning to do is we still have a little bit of paperwork to do and, and double check numbers and whatever, but our goal is to submit this packet to headquarters in early February to get that process rolling. And once again, the uh, 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 collaboration between ecology and EPA has really helped DOE uh, put this together. Uh, so I think we have a good path forward that gets us out of the grind that we've had over the past several years of not having, of having that packet gap. We saw this as an opportunity and uh, I'm frankly excited about what's going to happen. I think we, uh, we are moving forward in the right direction. And uh, soon, as soon as we submit the packet, uh, it, it, uh, that then becomes a DOE function, and I will be following that closely as, as it goes through. So that's the latest and greatest on the recruitment. Ryan? Thanks, Ruth. I'll turn my camera on this time. Um, I just wanted to echo largely what Roberto and Mike and Gary have said is, is I think one of my biggest goals um, from ecology this last year was getting this back to a really good collaborative process, uh, TPA process. And I think we've seen that in this last cycle. And, and as this new recruitment cycle comes up for the next fiscal year, um, uh, we're all aiming to do an even better outreach recruitment engagement effort. You know, like like Gary said, recruitment's not, you know, it's we have that kind of recruitment window of filling applications in fall, but, you know, recruitment really is kind of an all year thing. And we want to in the next cycle, we want to be looping in and getting assistance from the have more. We want to be doing more um, outreach and engagement with the communities to try and, you know, reach those 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 kind of folks that were trying to reach and get engaged with Hanford cleanup. So, you know, this I, I see this last cycle as a very good start. Uh, with with room for improvement, and we're all going to be aiming to do an even better outreach engagement and recruitment cycle next go around, and, and we definitely want to be um, looping in the HAB um, a lot more in the next upcoming cycle, and and getting your guys's help with filling vacant seats, um, you know, getting organizations to fill, you know, for example, that vacant public health seat that we have still that's that's still existing. So we really want to try and fill some of those vacant seats or seats that will be vacant. And and um, so I just wanted to share some of those comments. And my other comment was, um, as an aside, we're trying to see, you know, one thing that I, I that we still struggle with is is the length of time it takes for the packets to get approved. You know, five or six years ago, uh, it only took, I think, a couple months, three or so months for the packets to get approved to headquarters. And that 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 process has now become a 15 or 16 step process that takes six to seven to eight months to approve packets. And, and I just don't see that as, is feasible or viable you know if some folks if we're if they're getting applications turned in and you know let's just say october november and they don't get appointed for for another full year you know that the, the fall in october you know life circumstances can change in a year we might see some folks that that they apply and they're approved but then they can't serve on the board because it's a full year later um so so you know ecology david and i are looking at and trying to see if there's folks we could talk with at on energy's level and, and i understand that mike and folks have been trying to to see if there's anything that can be done, you know, on the DOE headquarters side about, you know, shortening that that packet approval length because um, I just I just don't see the length of time as super viable right now. Like Gary said, we're doing a better job of of turning the the, the timings around so we submit the packet so we don't have that 
that packet gap where, you know, this last year where we, where we saw that gap from uh, the packets didn't get approved till I think November of this last cycle, but that was because of, uh, you know, when we submitted the packet last year, that's not going to happen this year. Um, but regardless, the length of time for packet approval is still a little bit too long in my opinion, and, and we're looking to ways to, to hopefully shorten that in the future. Uh, but again, I wanted to give my thanks to Mike and Roberto and Gary for, for the collaboration this, this, this cycle. So you've heard the TPA agencies talk about recruitment um, and how important that is. Um, for those that are new, the HAB being a board of interests, the organizations that are re represented at the table select and recommend their own uh, people to represent them. So if you're from a city, a county, a public interest group, it is your group or your government agency that says, we want you to represent us on the HAB. There are a number of seats, um, the non-union, non-management, Rob, um, and the public at large, that the nominating authority for those seats is actually the tri-party agencies themselves. And that's why you hear the importance of this collaboration and the importance of recruitment. Because if they're the nominating agencies, they have to find those people. And that's where they want your help. So when they're talking about recruitment, that's an important part. Um, the design in the HAB originally was that those public at large seats were partly intended to help increase the diversity of the board. That was one of the explicit goals. So that's why helping them out is to your benefit. Rose. Yeah, so just, I guess, so I understand that a little bit. If, if we need somebody, as an example, who might be interested in doing something like this, they would contact who? Okay. <laughs> And is there, um, I guess, I, I think I already know the answer to this, but if, I mean, it's the person, or they wouldn't have to like live here, they could live like down river, like down in Vancouver or someplace like that and still be like a, an interested party from like the public at large as an example. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm just kind of trying to figure out boundaries and that type of thing as well. Thank you. We're all staring at Gary. <laughs> <laughs> the people online can't see that we're all staring at sure. Gary. Uh, have have the person apply, and uh, and what what we do is the three agencies will get together and accept or ask additional questions. We do have a. Uh, an applicant from somebody who lives in well outside of our normal area, a little bit further downstream than Longview. And, and I can't think of the name of that community, that county, but uh, basically the, the region is, is kind of the area that we're looking for. We, we prefer people who live closer to the Hanford site. So you really have, have a good uh, understanding of what's going on. However, there are a heck of a lot of folks who are outside of, of this general area who have an interest or have some knowledge or uh, uh, maybe some expertise that would be good for the board. So we're willing to accept uh, applications. The uh, uh, TPA agencies will, will go over them which we did. Tom, Cecilia. There you There's go. The mute There's the mute button. Hi. Um, so speaking to what Ryan said about um, the past practices, uh, just an anecdote. Uh, I started with uh, Odo um, in July of 2018 and had a HAB application in uh, a week later and was on the board by the end of the year. Uh, so that's how it used to work. I, so before all the steps. Other questions about the packet appointments, helping find people to join the HAB? Chris. So Mike, to summarize simply, how many new people are going to be coming on the board in the next cycle? Two. 
which is next, which is October 1st. Right, so we're shooting for between September 1st and October 1st for the new, new set of folks to join you, which would be a combination of new people and reappointments. Yeah, I'm doing the math real quick here. So I'm just trying to buy you time. Thank you. So I've got uh, six new members for public at large. Um, five new alternates. Six new primaries. I think we're there. Yeah, 17 that's I, new that's faces. That's I have my notes here. Does that resonate with you? Similar, similar turnover to this year. I think 16, this year was like 16. Yeah. And of course, it's also, uh, yes, as, as Mike mentioned, we have two new organizations that will be joining. That's also really important as well, uh, because we're, we're one of the things that we're trying to do is, is also make sure that we are reaching out to um, more people, more groups. And with the Tri-City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and Columbia Basin College coming on board. Those are big wins for this board, uh, very big wins. And I'm excited to see them take the place at, at their table and uh, continue to grow from there. Jeff. So moving forward after, uh, after this year, the issue will be retention as well as recruitment. So I'd like to hear the TPA's um, thoughts on retention. I'll, I'll lead off with what my thoughts are on retention. I think it's directly proportional to their experience, quite frankly. Um, uh, part of that experience is, is really um, uh, shaped by the experience they have with the HAB collectively. Um, primarily, my first thought on that is in its orientation and its continued orientation. We had a great orientation session. There was a lot that went into that, and um, that was a win. And and everybody that was involved with uh, planning and implementing that strategy and those associated tactics, um, uh, I think, what had an understanding coming out of it that orientation was not just a one-time uh, uh, iteration; that it that it's ongoing. And so, from my perspective, part of it is. Uh, continuing to influence the experience folks have. You know, if I were if I were participating on on your side of the table, um, you, your your time is valuable, right? And there are all kinds of competing interests for your time. And so, at some point in time, there's a tipping point between my passion for participating in something and the time that I have available. And then, then those value judgments are really, uh, I think, I have members value judgments individually. They're they're not all the same. And so. Um, uh, I, I think with respect to retention, it's about um, it's about the experience that they're having. It's about the sense of contribution that they're having. One of the very first things that I said, I'm going back to May when we were at um, Ben Franklin Transit and I had the opportunity to be introduced and talk a little bit about myself. Um, Mike personally is that that throughout throughout my working life, um, if it if there's if I do not feel like I'm being able to make a po co positive contribution in something, I lose interest very quick. And I know enough about myself that I move on. My life is short. Yeah, the older I, I get, the, the more I appreciate that. And, and perhaps that resonates with you as well. So to be brief, I think it's about the experience. And uh, we all have um, an opportunity to help shape that experience. Let's check in with Gary, Ryan, and Roberto. Do you have anything to add? Mike said it very succinctly, and I have nothing to add. Ryan. Yeah, let me just kind of tack on to what Mike and Gary were saying that, um, you know, this last cycle, we had some public at large and some other members that, uh, you know, in the last year or two, they were new HAB members and they, they kind of attended orientation or maybe only a couple meetings and then didn't really attend any HAB meetings after that. Um, I think retention uh, to your question is very important. You know, we're looking for HAB members to join the board that are going to engage, actively participate. You know, we don't expect folks to attend every single meeting and, you know, um, 
uh, you know, every single committee meeting, every single meeting, that kind of thing. But we'd love to have members that that routinely kind of join, uh, have meetings and engage in the process. And so as we do our recruitment, we're looking for members that are going to be, you know, active participants and engaged. So we're hoping that when we do this recruitment, that we're getting folks that will regularly engage and participate. And so retention doesn't become um, an issue. Uh, and of course, something to be mindful of is, is you know, with term limits being enforced is, is, you know, every six years, we're going to have members that, that will rotate off the boards. So we're going to have to fill those seats. But, you know, we love to see members um, fill out their maximum terms and, and serve, um, you know, the most they can and regularly engage. So we're just looking to, um, you know, get that retention and keep that retention up. That's right. And we engage two-legged people and four-legged people. <laughs> yes, sorry. This is <laughs> <laughs> Sign him up. Roberto and then Rose. Uh, yeah, just to add on to what Mike and uh, Gary and Brian uh, have already mentioned. Um, so we're trying to uh, encourage that these uh, participants or these organizations continue to be active on the board. But it's also worth considering that, you know, some people, uh, they might consider to join the board for only one term or just two terms. And that's something that's out of our control. And um, something that we also have to be considerate of as well so uh all that being considered we're trying to uh, make sure that uh, they also have a very positive experience with the with the board okay rose if you could hold on just a sec yeah th thank you rose so um to as a segue uh, i think that that also there's something we're not in control of as well and that is um uh, the, the level of participation in your decision making, Jermaine, to um, continued participation by an individual uh, based upon their level of participation. If you read your, your process document, you'll see that there's some expectations in there, or at least some, I'm going to call it guidelines at the moment, because I think the jury's still out on, on the relevance of, of that document to what is expected versus what is suggested. Um, but but the, you do have some language in there that speaks to, hey, look, if you've got somebody that um, started out uh, with the best of intent and for, for whatever reason has not been able to participate, it uh, provides an option for you um, to, um, uh, to, to work to find somebody perhaps that um, can participate um, more than, than what's observed. So I'd, I'd make that clear too, that that's somewhat of an unknown and, and within the HAPS control presently. Rose. Yeah, I just want to add that I'm, I mean, you got me because this is part of my job. So obviously retention is not an issue for me, at least as long as, you know, she keeps me on board uh, <laughs> anyway. But what I was going to say was for somebody new, I mean, coming in, like say from the public at large or another group or anything, it's very easy to get discouraged um, at a meeting when you really don't follow or understand what's going on. and. Um, I've been around Hanford for over 20 years, so I'm kind of up on a lot of the things that have been going on for a number of years. However, for somebody new coming in, uh, and I'm going to say the biggest issue, because I even struggled with this, you know, at, at meetings, is just the use of acronyms even, you know, that constant use. You're sitting at a meeting and, and acronyms are going, you know, left and right. I mean, I've developed emails and I look at it to read it back and I have a whole sentence of acronyms. I'm like, geez, you, you know, we, we right. use them. Yeah, that's yes, right. <laughs> Small words and the, and then acronyms. Um, and, you know, and that's okay. But even for me, you know, somebody who's kind of lived in that world, acronyms that are being used here are different than maybe some of the acronyms that I use in my field or my profession or something. And so, I, you know, for, for even for me to keep track of that and to be able to really understand what's going on, honestly, if I was just a person kind of coming in and not really familiar with that, um, I would have, I would get discouraged coming to these meetings thinking that I don't have a clue what's going on. I, therefore, I have no contribution because I don't even know what's going on. And so just as a, a, a cautionary thing out there, when we're, when we are having these meetings, we've got new people on to really be mindful of how we're putting things and even the use of acronyms and that type of thing to make sure that people feel that they're being included and that they understand what we're talking about. That's all. All right. So I've got three cards in three minutes. Michelle, Rob, and Chris. Well, Rose's comment was a nice segue to what I was thinking, which is also, uh, 
uh, more information and more frequently is also not necessarily the best way to uh, inform and get people engaged. Uh, I've been on the HAB board since um, uh, just October. Uh, I set up a rule on my Outlook to have all the HAB emails go into a folder because all of a sudden the HAB email spigot turned on and, and I was completely overwhelmed. And <laughs> so since uh, about September uh, to now, my HAB folder as of this morning had 123 emails in it in, you know, four months. Um, that's a lot of information. And I recognize that um, much of that is just, you know, forwarding of press releases and that kind of thing. Uh, if I could wave my magic wand, I would love to just get an email, you know, once a week that has links to those rather than multiple emails to try and figure out what, what what's, oh yeah, that's nice to know that Lawrence Livermore did this thing when, you know, I'm really just wanting to know kind of what's going on with, with my own facility and my own community and trying to understand the HAB. But also when it comes to committees, um, I know I signed up for committees. I have yet to participate in any committee meetings. I still don't 100% know whether those committees have met and I just missed the communication of when they were to meet or how to engage. You know, Teams is also another one where as, a, as an organization who uses Teams, I am very familiar with Teams. However, the HABS team is, I have to be out of my team for my office that I'm in all the time mm -hmm. in order to log into the Teams for the HAB to see what's in there. So I don't get notifications from it if I'm not in it. Um, so just kind of being mindful that you might be putting information in the team or files in the team or commi committees might be talking and people might not actually be getting those notifications or understanding that the information is there. Right. Let me explore if we can, because there are at least two standard emails we send a week that are those Lawrence Livermore things. If we can get permission to link those just to the Thursday update and make the Thursday update if we can cut down a couple of emails and and it becomes more of a one-stop shop okay let's we'll see if we can do that rob <clears throat> i think one of the things that we kind of missed in our discussions is the fact that these meetings are also to serve as a point of education I mean, we're, we're learning from DOE, we're learning from ecology, we're learning from our tri-parties. Um, and so, um, so I really think that that's an important aspect here is it's a two-way street, but we need to know. And, and I think that the newer people here would also benefit by the learning, um, give us lessons. All right, for example, um, what does it take to get a permit through ecology? What goes into the development of a permit? Well, that's a black box. You know, I, and, and, I, and I know that that could probably be explained in a committee of the whole in an hour, but, but it's an important piece of information. Or um, tell us about a readiness review. You know, we, we talk about this readiness review for um, the WTP or for the DF Law Project. Um, can we learn about it? Can we get some discussion of what is going to go into it and the development of it? So people can know what they can comment on. They can they can ask questions. Um, you know, it was it wasn't until like about 2007 through 10 that the whole idea of a stop work order came out that that we impl implemented all of our projects. Um, that was a very important aspect, and, and I find that a lot of people don't understand it. What is it? What does it do? How is it playing safety? So I think that the uh, DOE can do, and, and, and ecology and, and uh, DPA can do us a big favor by more of these educational type of, of processes. For example, our last committee of the whole, we learned about um, the record process, the circular process, the TPA and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's really important to us. And I don't know how somebody can be a member of this group and not know uh, something about those. And so, so like I said, I think it's a two-way street, not only what we feel go forward for advice, but we also need what the agencies 
can can help us understand with their project. Thanks. All right. We're going a little bit into board business, but I want to round this out with Chris, Steve, and Ryan. Chris? One of the things that we discussed when we talked about resource teams, and I don't believe has really been mentioned yet, is that they offer a possible opportunity for mentoring on a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, a, a smaller basis than, say, you might have uh, as, a, as a chair of a committee where you have 20 members on the committee and a couple of them are brand new. Um, so I, I, that's something to bear in mind, too, because we did talk about mentoring as possibly one of the, one of the tasks that the resource teams could do, um, again, on, on a small, smaller basis than a, a committee chair to a new committee member. With a beer in front of you. With a beer in front of no. Or a glass of wine. Glass of wine. Gonna have to pay attention as to what building we hold committee meetings in. <laughs> Steve. Um, I just wanted to uh, go to Rose's point and recall how the, the waiting period for um, being granted uh, a seat. Um, if, if there is a way or it, could it be possible since we all uh, recognize that public participation is something we're trying to encourage that once an application has been filed, um, Gary, is there a way to then put them on a distribution as as just public? Because to Rose's comment and my experience too, it takes several meetings before you even feel like you can breathe again related to the fire hose. So um, one, it would be nice as, as somebody who's applied to get a response um, shorter than six months um, to say, you know, we're in process, we really appreciate, and here are the potential um, opportunities for you to attend and gain some insights as to how the structure works. Um, and I just want is that seemed uh, feasible or is that possible since we do have a public participation element? Obviously, they couldn't be doing, you know, a committee as a whole participation or perhaps, but. Mike? I want to take a shot at it, Gary, if you got an eraser, throw it at me if I misspeak. So um, I, th I think that we attempted to do that um, this last go around. Um, first, I'm going to say yes to the timeline. I mean, we, we all recognize that that um, um, is, uh, in, in my words, quite frankly, at this point, unfortunate. Um, we struggle to really understand um, on the DUE side what was taking so long back east. Um, uh, the, the package with general counsel seemed to, um, we were told it's in, it's out, it's moving forward, yay, then it's back, it's out, it's moving forward, yay, then it's back, and we really didn't understand that. You know, the, the, each of the 16, I think there's 16 steps, you know, they were, they were uh, clearly described to us when we traveled to um, Santa Fe in our time together uh, with, uh, with the MSSAB there. Um, however, what really isn't clear is what happens within that one of those boxes, right? And and why that takes so long. Um, so so yes, um, I'm with you there. You know, we also attempted locally to to lean forward a little bit and be inclusive um, uh, in our first attempt at at our elections. And um, you know, I remember sitting at this table in this room saying, "Hey, uh, maybe it wasn't this room." It was this room. Yeah. I've slept since then. So saying, hey, look, what we really want to do there is be inclusive. We had we we knew we were at the last steps. There was no information that would indicate that there would not be any approvals. But the fact that the matter is, is that because those new members were not yet formally um, appointed, uh, uh, I, I erred in that decision making. So um, I, I believe there's an opportunity to be inclusive um, and, and bring folks along. I, I have a sense that there's an appropriate time to do that. Uh, and that that level of, of inclusiveness in engaging folks early and, and helping them uh, understand or or at least opt in to 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 um, I won't say opt in but, but at least be aware of what's being discussed. Not only provide somebody with an opportunity to say, "Whoa, that's more than I thought it was." I'm out, which is which is good, right? It lets us know early on where, where we stand with somebody and the opportunity there. But we have to be careful also about the level of engagement, right? Because they're they're not yet appointed. And so that balance, I think we'll have to seek to understand moving forward. Is that helpful, Steve? 
Yeah, thanks, Mike. I guess I was just thinking as there a place for public in general to just know this is an opportunity as as a, as a public participant, they can listen they can. to and be a part of those. So at least it gives them the chance to try to feel um, some educational opportunities are there for them. Understood. Thanks. Ryan, you've got the last word on this topic. Hey, thanks. Sorry, uh, I'll be quick. I just wanted to share one other thing that, that we've been working on um, the, the agencies over the last year or so while we've been working on this recruitment cycle was uh, DOE had a document that they put out in 2012. You can see it on the Hanford.gov website. It's called the Have Nomination and Application Have Nomination and Application Process Document, um, or something similar like that. Uh, but we went and you know, you know, kind of live in a different world today with with the HAB and with and, and with the MSSAB boards since 2012, particularly in the last year with term limits and all all that stuff. So we've worked over the last couple months to update that document. Um, you know, as a between the three agencies and so this document it outlines kind of the process for nominating for recruiting for filling seats and also D has some information about term limits as well as term limit exceptions for those organizations and members that um, want to request uh, exceptions to their term limits and and moving forward this document we're we're going to have this instituted with the next membership cycle and and i should note that the uh that that again, term limits apply to all members, and that this term limits exceptions process um, will also apply to all um, board members, you know, regardless of of, of organization. So it's it's going to be uh, just a process that that each organization is going to have to undertake to to submit that that exception process. And we're going to share that document here with the HAB um, here soon. I know we're just about finalized the the draft of it. And we'll we'll share it with the board. Um, I'm not sure when, but but soon. Right. So the last piece on the agenda is board business. Um, in terms of action items and next steps, um, the the big one that comes to mind is your participation in committee meetings and the committee of the whole as we talk about how to make committees work better um, and coming with your ideas and your questions and your concerns. Um, the Thursday update you get has all of the upcoming coming meetings. We usually go out four weeks, sometimes six weeks, so you can see what's on the calendar coming up. Um, announcements, if, if something's hot, we've added a new section on committees. So if there are, are documents or things of particular interest to specific committees, that can highlight those things. So committee chairs, there's a there's another venue for, whoa, this cool new report came out and I want to tell my committee. Um, so we're trying to consolidate um, in that Thursday update. Um, some of you read it and some of you don't. Um, but Josh, make sure it goes out on Thursdays. Are there any other key action items or next steps that you want to remind us about, Rob? Yeah, I'd like to <clears throat> remind folks that we have a Tank Waste Committee meeting coming up in February on the 8th, right? Right. <clears throat> and um, we're going to have a nice presentation from uh, Tom Fletcher about the progress on the WTP and the DF Law project. <clears throat> the um, um, And I think it'll be a very good meeting. Um, I guess two notes that I took notes on here is that um, we've got an NAS report and an AOA report, and each one of them are monstrous volumes. And so any members of the Tank Waste Committee that would like help to read those documents, you highlight something out of them that you feel that you want to make a comment on, and try to get it to um, myself or my new vice chair, Rob. Um, <laughs> and... and um, and uh, and so we can we can start collating some of those, especially on AOA. I, I looked at that and it was like over 300 pages. And I got to finish the NSA first or NAS report first before I get to that. And and so um, so these are these are kind of challenges. And people that can get skim really good and highlight things, they're needed. Michelle, please join right. the committee. NAS is National, National Academy of Sciences. Right. AOA is Analysis of, of Alternatives. Right. They, they're both in the tank waste treatment space. Right. 
And and then my last note um, was is that um, besides needing readers <laughs> for those documents, but um, you know, tours, 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 tours. They're so important. Um, can we plan, Gary, maybe on a tour before DFLog goes hot? I mean, before they really shut it down and we can't go on on the site with, without badges and radiations and things of that sort. Um, maybe. One of the really good things about HAB membership is that the HAB is a priority group for tours. So the answer is yes, we need to kind of work logistics and timing and things like that. So it is a priority of the department to open the doors of the site and to get folks out as, as we can, because we've got, as, as Brian Vance mentioned yesterday, got a lot of great things going on out there and we want to show it off. Uh, so yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I think the tours are, Everyone that I've been on has been, you learn things, uh, even progress you learn. Um, I'd like to see the new water treatment building or something of that sort. I think that it's about done, isn't it? Of course, the virtual tour is online right That's now, right. and it's available for anybody at any time. So if you're having a sleepless night and the uh, warm milk isn't doing anything for you, log on and... You, you can take your time. The, the neat thing about the uh, virtual tour is you will see a lot of things that you will not be able to see out on ground. Uh, there are many sites within the uh, waste treatment plant that are closed uh, to the general public that we have photos of that you can see. And it's being updated regularly. So please take advantage of that. All right, I've got Dan and Tom Cecilia in queue. Dan, you're online. Uh, thank you. This may be premature. I was just talking, thinking about uh, uh, scheduling uh, call requests for, uh, for for the future. Is that premature? No, that's okay. Uh, what are you thinking, Dan? Well, uh, the next February seventh uh, pick meeting, I'm going to call for an IM team to for the pick and have budget to delve into that. Uh, if that's approved, then I'm going to need a committee call uh, uh, for the IM team to report to and get consensus on whether or not to go forward with a uh, an advice to the uh, to the board. And so uh, looking at uh, seventh is 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 the uh, the, the pick. And then sometime between I don't know, March, late February, early March, for a, 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 either a second IM team or a sec, a, 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 another PIC meeting to approve the IM team's advice before it goes to the board. Okay, okay. We'll flag that for the, the PIC meeting and, and do the scheduling at that point then. Okay, so thank, thank you. For, yeah, thank you for. Uh, we'll put that on the radar. Um, I lost my list. Tom Cecilia. Hi, everybody. A uh, shameless plug for the River and Plateau meeting, uh, which is if you're in town for the uh, cleanup priorities public meeting on March 6th and then you stay or no. Yeah, and then you stay for the uh, Committee of the Whole on March 7th. You can stick around again for March 8th, which is the River and Plateau meeting. Um, we've got a preliminary agenda to talk about uh, some cleanup on the Central Plateau and potentially uh, the 324 building updates. I uh, also want to remind everybody that now that uh, the full board election is over, we are in committee election season. So there's going to be a chance to uh, throw your hat into the ring for a committee chair and vice chair for all the committees in February and March. Um, it's a year long term and uh, you really get to get behind the sausage making. Um, so that's all I had. Thank you. All right, Chris and Rose, Chris. I just want to ask Rob and, and Dan in their committee meetings to leave a little bit of time for either Tom Cecilia or myself uh, to talk to the committees 
uh, about the committee optimization process that we've been going through. We alluded to it yesterday, but I just want to make sure there's a little bit of time uh, in each of those committee meetings uh, for Tom or myself to to talk on a on a smaller basis and get get feedback. Right. Rose. Yeah, so I'm looking at my calendar here and the the dates that was just said March 8th and March 6th are not. They don't show that there's a committee wrap meeting on March 8th. Did I get that wrong or? No, actually within the last week, the dynamics have been um, kind of fast. So okay. that's that's why the calendar isn't as accurate as you want it to be. Okay, I just, cause I'm obviously trying to see what I can, and then I didn't catch what was going on on March 6th that they were wanting us to make note of. The, the TPA agencies are trying to nail down a date for their annual cleanup priorities meeting. Um, I, I don't know if March 6th has been confirmed, but it is is one of the dates under discussion. I'm looking around like, I don't wanna misspeak. The 7th, um, because we literally nailed down the venue of the Committee of the Whole yesterday morning before the board meeting. So there's a Committee of the Whole on March 7th. And what that meant was we had to move the wrap meeting to March 8th. And, and that literally all happened yesterday. Um, so, and then, the, yeah. So the committee of the whole is on the seven. I'm just looking at the color coding, and that's a different. Right, color and the, and the color coding is actually wrong on okay. your map. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Because like stuff changed yesterday. <laughs> okay, so you, I'm assuming you're gonna be seeing anyone in these back Yeah. Rooms. So okay. we'll update this. the 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 most current information you're gonna get is in the Thursday weekly update that because we actually talked to Gary on Thursday mornings and double check all of our stuff. So your Thursday update is the most accurate you're gonna get. I have. Oh, I was just gonna add on to the, the March 6th uh, cleanup priorities, uh, the annual cleanup uh, priorities meeting. Uh, that's still being finalized, but you know, because of, again, logistics and just trying to uh, and nail down the venue that it will be hosted at. Yeah, so, all right. So I've got Dan Solitz and Alfonso. Oh, your card went down. Uh, yeah, this is Dan again. Oh, okay. I just want to add up what, what Tom mentioned about elections coming up. You can also self-nominate as well as nominate others. So. Uh, we're in need of leadership, so think about it for yourself. Think about it for others. Thank you. Yeah, and for any nominations for leadership, whether it's board leadership or committee leadership, the facilitation team will ask, "Are you willing to serve?" Meaning you can't get voluntold. You get to say yes or no if you're nominated. It's a thing. All right. So in the work plan. The dates have now changed from the work plan. Are we is the For subject March. change? Has the subject changed then? Are we still going to get a wrap 324 building disposition? Um that is the tentative plan. Right. I'm working on three agendas right now and I can't remember what's on all three okay. at the moment. Okay. okay. <laughs> we had a we had a we had a leadership call for wrap uh, earlier this month and we have uh, a loose framework for what the topics will be, and 324 is one of them. Okay, thank you for remembering that. At this at this point in a HAB meeting, I I don't remember stuff. Um, Steve Anderson. Uh, just looking back at my notes here, and I've got something um, uh, on grout. The end of this month, there was a conference. Is there something on grout? Uh, I don't can I don't I, have a have thing on grout. 30, Am I missing something? 31st and 1st. Okay, so Rob, was there anything do you know of? You'll see in the the weekly update that comes out today there are links to the the websites for the two National Academy of Sciences meetings. Okay, that's what it is. And that's probably Perfect. what yep. it is. Thanks. So th they're not have things, but we did link that in because you might be interested. Right. Alfonso Is is there somewhere where we can get this updated? Um, do you have a site 
for it so we can print it out? It's posted on the HAB website on Hanford.gov, the most current version. Like I said, it changed yesterday, so we right. haven't updated it yet because okay. we were here. Hanford.gov. So if you go to Hanford.gov and you click on Outreach, you'll see the option to go to Hanford Advisory Board. And under HAB, um, I think it's under, is it under guidance documents? Um, the work plan, the calendar, the charter, our operating ground rules, all that stuff is there. Um, so we will get this, this updated and reposted. Like I said, it all changed yesterday. On a continuing question is uh, April 2023 on the red uh, board meeting. That's the board of the whole, is that correct? Or Yes, that is this body meeting in February. Okay. Yeah. In February? I mean, in April. Gosh. In April? Okay. Back. Is that going to be in Tri Cities or is that actually going to be in Yakima? It's going to be in Richland. Oh, okay. We'll we'll rebook the location then. Lacey, note to self. <laughs> We need to we need to book here for April and cancel the Yakima reservation. Um, okay, I don't know what order they went up in. Richard and then Michelle, because we haven't heard your voice, Richard. I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, uh, I I don't know since I I had a doctor's appointment this morning. Did Becky mention anything about H seven? No. Okay, so Enlighten that's us. why I jumped up. Oh, no, I, I just wanted to say I'd like to plan an HSEP call for, you know, the coming month. How's the 28th of, Feb of February sound? It's not going to work because I'm going to be at a conference. Uh, so I don't know if there's another time I'll, we can. Schedule. I'll get with you and Becky and we'll figure sure, it out. We'll figure out, but I think we need to have a call. Yeah, okay. We'll figure it out. Michelle. Super fast question. In the work plan on the calendar uh, with the committees, there are uh, numbers behind them. RAP4, HSEP1, PIC2-3. What do the numbers mean? So if you look deeper into the work plan, you're going to see a table of topics for each of the committees and there are numbers in those tables. Gotcha. Thank so you. that's a cross reference. Okay, thank you. That's right, the roadmap helps. Okay, so we're gonna do a two minute and a two minute lightning round and try something that we actually haven't done before because we're adventurous. Um, there was a request made that we do some evaluations of the meetings so that we can get better. So, um, this is going to be popcorn and fast. I'm going to ask you two questions. The first question is, what went well for you yesterday and today? Anyone? Jeff? Um, Casey's Six Killers presentation and uh, was great. And the dialogue and the <clears throat> um, round robin introductions uh, was was really valuable to me to learn a little bit more about the uh, the board members so that was great others what went well we finally okay. got through the elections <laughs> <laughs> oh i will drink to that this is Dan. So okay. what went well for me was when uh, uh, I was asking the budget contracts committee to consider uh, a, a, a portion for the budget on the on the HAB and the PIC that, uh, that Chris suggested that we do it ourselves. And I don't know why I hadn't thought of that before, but it really went well. It's that it's like a light went on there, so that was good. Rose. I'm going to I'm going to jump on the introduction bandwagon because I really feel like 
that was really valuable to kind of hear just even just briefly a little bit about who's who, you know, not only in the room, but also to have the folk online included. For me, it's really important too, to kind of know who's participating. And if I were a new person at this meeting, that would certainly be something that I would want to know is who am I in the room with? What, what are people's interests? What are their, you know, expert areas of expertise, who they represent, all of that. So I think that that's a valuable asset to the meeting, especially when we see that there's new people in the room. Tom. Uh, I'd like to <clears throat> do a shout out for Chris and Tom Cecilia for the presentation on the on the uh, work group. I thought it was very informative and helpful. All right. Okay. Second question. What do you wish went differently? I would like uh, a a helpful thing would be, and I'm sure it's in my wonderful binder, but for meetings, if there was a little laminated card that had the most common acronyms on it that someone could just reference really quickly when people were talking, that would be amazing. Jeff. I think DOE does a very good job of in their presentations of, of showing us what their challenges they're facing. I don't always get the same sense from ecology and EPA. Uh, their updates are good, but what's, you know, what's your biggest challenges? And I, we, I don't get a sense for what, you know, what's holding you back in doing a great job. Tom? I kind of hesitate to mention it, but because we we're locked into it, but I would question the evening sessions of the first day. Um, I The reason I asked a question about how many public were attending yesterday, because I didn't see any. I didn't recognize that there were some new faces that weren't associated with either the agencies or the, the HAP. So I don't know. We, we I think I would suggest we just look at it in the, going forward. Chris and then Richard. As I get older, aside from losing more hair, um, and my eyesight gets a little weaker, I've, I find it very awkward to continually have to turn my neck or go back there to see what's on the screen. And it'd be helpful if somehow we could rearrange the room so you're looking at it rather than having to twist around. And I think the people who sit in in this aisle, especially, you know, if they want to see what's on the screen, have to do a 180 degree return. And I don't know if this is a room we have, whether that's just the way it is and and tough. But if there's some way to, to, to rectify that, that would be good. We have a map that we work with the hotels with. We can redraw a map. Mike? Uh, Chris, I'd just like to add that if I could. I, I'm on the struggle bus there as well. Sometimes it's just really hard to see them. And, you know, when we move from different venue to we, we have different venues, it, it, the dynamic changes. One of the things that, that I found that's helpful to me is to bring my laptop and then I see the presentation materials right in front of me. The struggle that I've had with that is my particular laptop. I've not been able to successfully connect everywhere, too. So I have to show up a little bit ahead of time. Um, to work through the logistics of that. So for, for your consideration, also, if I could, to Michelle's comment regarding the acronym list, it's dynamic. Um, so, so and you said a little laminated card. Um, I'm thinking 11 by 17 is what we're looking at. So <laughs> and maybe three pages front and back. But, um, but we, do, we do have a link. Uh, last time we talked about this is that we either do have a link or we're going to put a link to the, to the acronym list. And, and why I say dynamic, it's important to know that you can print it out once, but uh, next month it might have changed. And so the link is actually more cost effective. And so so consider that. Um, don't want to push back on the laminated card. Just want to be real about it. Frequently used acronyms. <laughs> there we go. Oh my gosh. I once facilitated a meeting where 
the three agencies all had the same acronym and it meant three different things. It was a very confused meeting. Richard. Well, I'll piggyback on that statement. There was a pretty good acronym list that Ecology provided in their handout. You might want to save it. It, it was pretty relevant. We'd help you through that. But my card was up, was piggybacking on the evening meeting. I guess the question really comes down to is lessons learned of what did, how do we advertise it? I mean, that, that would be the real question. It's something for pick or ever to, to look at is, you know, how would anybody have known? So. Right. All right. We're in overtime, Jeff. We're going to wrap this up. Okay. Um, on the evening meeting, one of the problem I have with it is it detracts from us informally getting together over dinner and, and a beer and talking about have business. And I think that's, a, that's very valuable. And we lose that if we're sitting around this table at 7 p.m. I'm worried about wordsmithing advice, um, which may happen in April. All right, last words, evaluating the meeting, things you liked, things you'd like to see differently. What's on, what's on your list? Lorene? Okay, get on the mic so we can actually hear you. Because I think you're talking about seeing you, but let's hear yeah. you too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, could we print the names a little? bigger so we can see them, you know, there's some places where we're farther away than this, but they're very small and to sit there. And like I said, a name like KC six killer was kind of complex. And I, of course I, anyway, my, my only point is, is it at some time when they redo these, could they kind of increase the font size? So that's all. <laughs> Play with it. Lorraine. Thank you. Um, I just kind of wanted to bring up uh, something that came to mind and um, is it kind of goes, you know, deep to the services that, you know, we all provide within this um, forum. And I, you know, was sitting here and I asked my husband about, you know, and, and Rose, you know, if there's any type of historical account of any individual, and I know, you know, a lot of you and your expertise may know an individual that worked at Hanford and, you know, since since it started in 1944. And I'm just wondering if there's some type of a memoriam um, in effect or, or reference somewhere at Hanford that memorializes individuals that, you know, pretty much, you know, gave their expertise you know in the fields that they worked and and may um you know not no longer be with us but you know i i think that it's um probably a good idea to maybe memorialize that and i don't know you know because i haven't been through every, it's been a long time since i've gone on tours and i know specific you know information that i've received when i've gone on the tours has been about you know it's been about the sites but I'm going a little deeper than that, and I'm wondering if there's anything to account for individuals that, you know, provided services, and and we can memorialize that somewhere. At one time, there was a really wonderful exhibition at the Reach Museum, Women of Hanford. So, and I think that I have also seen a, a Hanford um, area in the Richland Public Library um, that might address some of the biographies of the individuals. Um, yeah, I think that there are things out there. Yeah. Lorene, Ryan also just posted in the chat, um, Hanford Oral Histories is a good resource with interviews. And he provided the link. Right. Thank you. All right, Chris, last word, and then we need I was, to adjourn. I was going to ask uh, just what Jan said. Uh, the Hanford Reach might have 
quite a bit of that in there. I haven't been there for a long time, um, but that might be a, a good source to look at uh, people who were uh, really important in, in, in terms of the Hanford history. All right. There are some things showing up in chat. We'll, we'll pull those out to put in the meeting minutes. Um, Voices of the Manhattan Project. Um, there's a history project at Wazoo Tri City. So, so people are 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 populating some ideas that that could also feed into it. Ginger. Yeah. Can you say? Can you save and? Can you save the list and email that to people? Um, I kind of felt like maybe you were asking about like a memorial to the people who contributed to this project. Um, my understanding is in the however 40 whatever years, like nobody, there were only like two deaths on site from accidents, which is actually really remarkable when you think about what they accomplished out there. But we do know that people over time did die of illness that was very much linked. And I had a friend who worked at PFP and was compensated for her premature death a few years ago. Um, so the government compensated her. So presumably that means that they thought they had some role in it. <clears throat> I think that's a really, really interesting question. Um, <laughs> there's a net, there's a group, if any, if any of you are affiliated with Richland High School, the Richland Bombers are an odd group. And no matter what you think of their tasteless name, uh, mascot, um, there are still Richland Bombers alive who meet on a regular basis for lunch who lived in the trailer parks that no longer exist. And it would be really cool. And maybe this is something that happened. The National Park Service don't ever really seem to interact. But maybe that's a conversation to see if there is a way to interact with the National Park Service um, and get some distributed things. Like, cause the, my understanding is the John Ball Elementary School where the trailer park kids went to school was actually just south of the ecology office. And it would be cool to have a plaque that recognized that. And, um, you know, the substandard housing. And I actually went to lunch with the, the John Ball kids, they call themselves the John Ball kids and Madeline Brown, who some of you may remember, and I went out to lunch with them before Madeline passed, which was 2016. And it was really funny listening to them because they were poor white kids and they were uh, outcasts and they were trailer trash as children. But when we met them, they were all retired physicists and engineers and chemists who had stayed here and worked here and contributed themselves. Um, so it would be cool if there were more physical memorials, whether to the contributions or to the passing of people who did eventually die from a disease that, you know, because of what they did in their work. Um, my understanding, Jan, is that the Daughters of Hanford exhibit is no longer on display. I just actually asked that question yesterday, and there's a Cold War exhibit at the Reach right now. So I invite you to continue this conversation in upcoming committee meetings and upcoming meetings. We actually are over time and need to adjourn. Mike. Yeah, thank you for participation over the last couple of days and, uh, and in the weeks leading up to it. Uh, we will not depart here without um, expressing appreciation to um, Jan Cottrell for her service. Um, as interim chairperson to Sue for her service as uh, interim vice chair and of course to uh, Pam for uh, her past service um, as uh, your national liaison. And so if you just take a quick moment, folks, and join me in recognizing those contributions, I would appreciate it. With that, we're adjourned.